Hotep. 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 Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. My brothers and Assalamu. sisters, I'm so happy to be back here at Grassroots Productions for a number of reasons. Um, for one reason is that I've had a chance to come and speak on a number of different issues. Uh, first, we dealt with the comedic origin of the universe, talking about our comedic ancestors and how they viewed the beginning of the universe, the importance of this. Because whether we realize it or not, much of who we are and what we are and what we become comes out of our understanding of astronomy. And even when you break down the word astronomy, you look at the word ast, which is our set, the feminine principle, and then ra. And so there's a lot of things hidden within these words. Another thing that's coming out in our research that we're doing, and, and I'd like to begin by just letting you know that it's very important that none of this be, uh, let's say, written in stone that our children and our children's children, there's so much that we have forgotten. And I often use the word forgotten as opposed to lost, because uh, psychologically, when you lose something, it gives you the impression that you must go outside of yourself to find it. But when something is forgotten, it means that it's within you, it dwells within you, and all you have to do is go inside of yourself, reach for it, and bring it up. Yes. Our ancient ancestors had a word they called heka. Heka meaning to go within, to bring out, and that's why we do meditation, and that's why we do all sorts of forms of incantations to go inside of ourselves to bring something out. Much of who we are and what we are and what we've got to do is always around us. And it's important that we know this. In so many different ways, the things that we're facing in our world today is as clear, is as clear to me as to why we're going through it as what we're actually going through. There's no problem I have in looking at what's happening today, that election a few days ago. Yes. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Um, that's why we named this, and when, when my brother Yusuf and those here at Grassroots asked me uh, for a title, and I used the word Crusades, and I used the word the Precurse, or the Precursor. Precursor gives the impression of something that comes before. And in so many ways, the Crusades were, was a, a symbol of what was yet to come. And that's why I subtitled it, We Should Have Seen Them Coming because much of what happened in the Crusades was a precursor to why we sit in this room today, wondering why we're going through. Well, I don't, Professor Clark, our teacher, our master teacher would say to us, he's surprised and we're surprised. It, it, it follows such a pattern that we, we are where we are today because the left foot steps in front of the right foot. It is only by nature that we're here where we are today. And one essence or the one thing that's gonna get us out is our consciousness. And that is what Heka is. Heka is to go within to bring out. And it was symbolized by the cobra or the uraeus, what uh, Chemites call the irta, I-R-T-A. And again, I want to be careful with the words that I use because again, we're still looking very closely at the comedic language. We're looking at a number of different languages that while on the, f on the front side, it looks like one thing, research will show us that there's so much more that we have yet to study. My job here is not to tell you what happened. My job here is to make us think. That's all I've ever wanted to be as a, as a teacher, is to make us think. Because we are too comfortable in this nonsense that they're teaching us. And we're reading these books as if these are gospel books, and as if what we're reading is actually what happened. There is so much that we have yet to study. But the one thing I do know is this, is that if there is to be salvation on the planet, it's going to come from us that we have a divine purpose to be in this part of the world, African folk. We were brought here specifically for a divine reason, and that was to save this planet. Because our ancestors saw the demise of certain things coming, and they wrote on the walls of ancient Kemet, which was then held within the bosom of the Moor. Because the reason why we even have a Western civilization today is because of the Moor. What's so important to understand about the Moor is that the Moor was just not Muslim. To say Moor is not equivalent to say Muslim. There were Christian Moors, there were Jewish Moors, there were Moors that carried the comedic legacy. Moor was African. It's like the word Ethiopia. Ethiopia means land of burnt face or people of burnt face. Well, Moor means people of burnt face, it meant black. In the language that came out of the Latin languages, Latin is no more, no less than the people that congregated around a place in Europe known as Latium. And out of Latium comes Latin. This is why I'm so concerned with our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters when I tell them to be careful by calling yourself Latino. Because if you're a Latino, so are Haitians. So are Brazilians. So is anyone who has centered themselves around the Latin language. But the Latin language doesn't exist. 
That's a figment of someone's imagination. As, as Napoleon III said, that history was a lie that was agreed upon by the world leaders. And so what has happened is that there has been a creation of a historical story told, agreed upon by leaders. They've okayed it to be put in books. We read these books and we think that's actually what happened. And that's just not how it happened. That's just not the history of the world. And that, that election the other day is, <laughs> it's no surprise, none whatsoever. This is a turning point in the history of our planet. They had to win that, just like uh, uh, his brother said, by hook or by crook. Yes. But what we didn't know, he, he, he did it hook and by crook. <laughs> it wasn't an or, it was and. And it's so obvious to me that they stole that election. Now, mind you, I didn't care for either. Let's make that plain. Neither of them have our interest at heart. But you have to understand why they don't have our interest at heart. Having our interest at heart means that they are signing their own suicidal death wish. We were here. We are the beginnings of all. We did not ask them to separate themselves from us. We did not ask them to do that. They did that voluntarily because of something that happened within their own pineal gland that made, that made them create a world that is called xenophobic, which means that you are, fear, you are fearful of the foreign. African folk not only aren't fearful of the foreign, they embrace that which is not like themselves because they know that there's only growth in opposition. If everybody agrees in something, there's no growth because we're all the same. It's only when someone comes with a different idea or a different way of living that you're allowed to grow. That's what I often said about Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had to quit because he couldn't become a better basketball player. Because if he could not become a better basketball player until a better basketball player stepped on the basketball court. And none came. Muhammad Ali, same thing with Muhammad Ali. In order for you to become better, someone better than you has to come into your presence. For civilization to move forward, it has to be pushed. It doesn't go on its own. What we're experiencing now is a civilization that is not being pushed. And why? Because we are not pushing it. We are the pushers of all civilizations. Every time you see civilizations rising, you see African folk behind pushing, agitating, pushing it forward. Not necessarily physically and violently, but just with new ideas. You don't see that now. That's why you have all of these things that you have these movies coming out, Rocky IV, Rocky V, Rocky 2000, because they have no more ideas. See, the idea of Rocky was for the European once again to beat Muhammad Ali. That was the image of Rocky. That's why it was so popular. Because when you look at it, Rocky wasn't really that great a film. <laughs> and it wasn't made that good either. And it was made from an actor that really wasn't a good actor. But what did he have? He had a dream that all folk have, and they wanted to see Muhammad Ali knocked down. That's why Rocky became such a great film. But you see, it was only a figment of their imagination because not one of them has ever become heavyweight champion again. So we're living in a society that the reason why it's not going forward, one of the finest films that has been made, that has made us think oh, since Malcolm X was bamboozled. There have been other films now. I'm not talking about the films that have come from other countries, other nations. I'm talking about the ones that have been put in front of us to look at in terms of creativity, using that camera in ways that cameras are not used. They don't have good ideas. All they can do is play with that computer. And why? Because the computer is something that they can physically manipulate. So it becomes something that they become good at. But even they did not create the computer, because I've seen pictures of sisters in ancient Kemet sitting before what would be a computer board. The whole idea of chess came from Senate, came from a strategy. The whole ideas of, of, of worry came out of, you know, the 12 uh, nights, the 12 hours during death of the ancient Kemites. That came out of, that's where the game comes from. That's where the whole concept of a dozen comes from. It comes from ancient Kemet and the 12 hours of the night and the, uh, the ability to move each stage of your, let's say, your movement in death, going under the, to the underworld, coming to each gate, to each door, you've got to have a special word. And having that special word, knowing that, means that you can move to the next gate or the next door. Well, all of that came out of games. That they, I, well, it, it came back and forth. The game was created to celebrate that idea of the 12 hours of the night of death. 
So you have worry. You have the whole idea of buying things by 12. The whole idea of the apostles, 12, with Christ being the 13th. That's why 13, that's why they make you afraid or try to make you afraid of the number 13. Because number 13 to African folk is a sacred number. It's a very important number. And you know I'm into Panthers, so you know how I feel about that black cat crossing my path. I'm looking for the black cat cross my path. These are the images that they've given us. This is the illusion that we're living under. And as long as they can, you know, there's a brother, Wade Nobles, Dr. Wade Nobles in California, that says that power is the ability to define someone's reality and have that person accept that definition. We're living under conditions where they have given us an illusion and we have bought into the illusion and we believe this illusion. We are living this illusion. And you know, even though something is an illusion, if you accept it, it becomes a reality. Yes, sir. Even though it's an illusion. It is your reality. So you create out of something that does not exist, something that does exist, because you create a life system that goes according to that illusion. So therefore, it's no longer an illusion. And this is what we're facing as a people. We are a mighty people, brothers and sisters. When you look at our history and you look at what we've been through, what they did to us, there's no reason why we should be here. There's no reason why we should be able to function intelligently as we're functioning. We're not supposed to be here. We're not we are supposed to be back in Africa. We are supposed to be stark raving mad or we are to be dead. But we are not meant to be in a room like this making sense with each other. We are not meant to be here being able to give each other money in terms of our trade. We should have been so bamboozled that we don't even know who we are. Yet not only do, do we know who we are, but we have embraced our past, realizing that it's not so much that it is to build new pyramids, it is to take the concepts of the brilliance that built the pyramids and move into the 21st century. Because our ancestors did the pyramids so well, we don't have to redo pyramids, that's not the purpose of the pyramids. The pyramids have served their purpose. They went on to building temples. The temples served their purpose. What is next now? And this is the story that we've come upon because I've often said that you cannot understand the predicament that we find ourselves in today if you do not understand what happened in 1492, October 1492. You cannot understand what happened in October of 1492 if you don't understand what happened on January 2nd, 1492, the day that Boabdil was expelled from Granada, the last, finest leader of Spain. Spain, Europe has not been the same. In fact, they have been devolving since the Moors were expelled from Spain. Nothing new has come out of Europe since that time. You can't understand what happened in January 2nd, 1492, if you don't understand what happened in July of 710, when the Moors first came in to Europe. You can't understand what happened, why the Moors would be there, if you don't understand the fundamental principle of what happened during the Byzantine Empire, during the Roman Empire, during the Greek Empire, and what the Greeks got from the Chemites. So you can see that from what I've outlined to you moving backwards, if you understand what happened in the past, you can understand the present. If you can understand the pattern from the past to the present, you then just apply the pattern like a mathematical equation to your present, and you can project your future. What they are hoping is that we don't get this formula together that we don't see this pattern that has happened. Whenever you see any greatness, whenever you see any movement, including a hip hop nation, we're behind it. The only reason why they have any kind of massive economy today is because it was built on our backs and it's built on our young people's back in the hip hop nation because that's what's channeling their young people today is the hip hop nation. Their children would have nothing if it wasn't for us. And then when you look at what's happening in the educational system and you look at what's happening in the prison system, they're still getting over on us. They're still playing us to our young people don't understand. Our young people, I, I work with them. I work for the Board of Ed in the Bronx, District 9 in the Bronx, South Central Bronx. And I, I'm with our children every day. I purposely moved my center from the district office, which is adult bound, to a junior high school, which, uh, which was a junior high school that they said really was the most troubled. The reason why I moved it there was because I felt that if all that I was saying, because I have a mouth, and if I, all that I say about culture and our children is correct, I wanted to go where it was the most challenged. Because if it could work there, it can work anywhere. Because there are some children in some of our schools, they don't need me. 
They're on the path already. All they need me for is just to check in with me every so often to make sure everything's all right with me. But they're all right. A good student doesn't need a teacher. Needs a facilitator just to keep them moving. But students who have that challenge, that need someone there, this is the school that I chose to go into. And I'm telling you, as sure as sure can be, our children are absolutely wonderful. Do I like some of the things I hear? No, I don't like some of the things I hear. Of course I don't. But it's the society that makes them conduct themselves that way. It's the society that gave them that N-word. We hear our young people on the bus. I mean, sometimes I'm on the bus and I hear them use that N-word. They use that word, so they use that word N like I use the word brother and sister. I've heard them use that B word on our sisters as if they're calling that sister their lover. They use that B word like it's a term of endearment. I love you, you sweet. They're not using it in the sense, he said he wanted to use that word so much that it wouldn't have any meaning anymore. Well, to the new generation that, that embraced that word, he was right. But to the older generation that lived through it, he was wrong. Because yes. that N word still sends shivers up my spine because I know what we've gone through with that word. I know that B word. I know them calling our women that B word on the plantation. See, our young people may not remember that because that bridge to history may not be there for them, but it's there for me. It's there for you, because I can see some of you agreeing with me. So I know that that B word and that N word, it means something to us. It's a curse on us. It's a word that we should never use. But nonetheless, it has been used. It's been used around our children and they have picked it up. There's no word that I hear our young people use. Like I was watching the Source videos last night and I saw a little Kim. Oh, that, that, that's an attractive sister. That's a brilliant sister. That's a talented sister. But I also know that sister, when she goes up to the executive producer, he tells her, if you don't do this, you're not getting your video. So sister is doing what can get her that video. I could, even Eminem came out and said, that they make him say those things about his mother. They made him say those things about his wife because it's not gonna sell. But not only that, behind all of this, this is a plan. This is a plan, not just for our children, but for their children. See, this is what people of European descent haven't gotten aware of yet. This is why when you see things happening in Columbine like that, everybody's talking about it's not supposed to happen here. Oh yes, it is supposed to happen here. And it's happening just when it's supposed to happen here. It's just that you're too ignorant to understand the plan. They have as little regard for their own children, their own mothers, their own wives, as they have for us. But we don't see that. When I say we, I mean they. They think they, they've been bamboozled. In fact, of all of the people on the planet, folk of color know when we've been bamboozled. We just happen to be in a situation where there's not too much control over it. But they honestly believe that because of their skin complexion, they are superior. This is something deep inside of them, a psychology thing. Now, there are some that know better, but for the most part, deep inside of them, they believe that because of their complexion, it's not supposed to happen. Because that's a white supremacist comment, by the way. It's not supposed to happen. In other words, there are places it's supposed to happen. There are places that it's acceptable to happen. But in Columbine, it's not. So much so, I developed an essay that I'm still completing because there's still things going on that won't let me finish it. It's called From Columbus to Columbine. Memories of Malcolm. Chickens have come home to roost. Because what's happening in Columbine is nothing but what Columbus started. Hitler was nothing but a stepchild to Columbus. I could have told them Hitler was coming when I saw Columbus on the water. This is why this evening's presentation, the concept of this connection is so very important. We've got to see the historical connection between this. And this is why Professor Clark taught us that history was a clock and that history was also like a map, and that you can't get over on a historically conscious people. You can force them to do something, but you can't get over on them. You can't bamboozle them, because they know the truth. They see the truth, but you just happen to have checkmated them for some reason or another. But there is such a connection between all of this that it's absolutely amazing that we don't see the connection. And that if we understood the conditions that we're living in and where we came from, we would understand why. I mean, look at Tiger Woods. 
Okay, now I know, I can't even pronounce what he says he is, okay? But putting that aside, the brother got game. Nobody's beaten him in golf for the least at next 30 years. He may lose one or two here and there. there we all have bad days. <laughs> but there's nobody gonna beat him now. We have taken over golf, which was supposed to be their sport. That the in tennis? That's the last one. Yeah, well, the last one really is one that brothers are ready to give him. Sisters say, I'm not getting on the ice, so you can have hockey. See, we like to be warm where we play. <laughs> they can have the ice because we're not used to ice. We are not an ice people, although if we would apply ourselves, we'd play well. Well. But we are not, we are not like that. We are not really going to jump on the ice right now and play because that's not our thing. Any other game that keeps you warm, we're there. I mean, the closest we'll come to an outdoor sport where we get cold is football. And that's because when we hit each other so hard, we get warm. And, that, and that's a seasonal sport anyway, so we get warm in the summertime and the springtime. But we're at the point in tennis, another one of their sports, that we got to play each other. And not just play each other, but families got to play each other because there's no one that can beat the Williams sisters. Can't beat them in the world. Can't beat them in the world because we got the Olympics down pat. Got the Olympics, we got this thing here. Sister got the, got the triple crown. She won every award that you can win. It, all over the world she's won them. Tiger Woods has won all the awards all over the world. They said we couldn't run marathons because our bones were too thick. We, we, we were what they call, what they call it? Exomorphic. We, we, we're heavy bone. We're big on the outside. Said so we can't run naturally. So now what are we doing? We're coming in first, second, and third in the marathons all over the world. You own the Boston Marathon. The Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon. They want to cancel it out. That's it. And they don't show us when we're coming across the thing anymore. <laughs> But you see, you can see what's going on. You can understand, and I'm trying to stay away from talking about superiority and inferiority because I've always believed that that's a spiritual thing. But I'll also tell you this, that if you take a people and you hold them down, well, let's take the opposite. Take a people and don't hold them down and encourage them to do well and they do well. That's great. But now take a person that you hold down and every time they try to get up, you hold them down. Yet, in spite and despite of that, they rise, they're greater. We as a people, and they have bred us to become superior to them. They have bred us that way. If they had just opened things up to let those that can do it, do it, we would make it, we would do well. But we wouldn't do it the way we're going to do it. And we're going to do it to the point where they're not going to be able to touch us anymore. These tests that they give our children, I'm one of the writers of the sixth grade social studies test for the state. Let me tell you something. These tests are the lowest forms of proving that you know something. To be able to take choices, to be given a question and be given four choices, is, and you choose the right question, you circle it in, that's the lowest form of knowing information. In fact, you haven't even proven to me that you're intelligent. All you've proven to me is you made the right choice. But now you take a, a, an equation, rate times time equals distance, and you give that test to a student, and they get out of 10 questions, they get nine wrong. And in their frustration, they then go out onto the basketball court and start shooting hoops. And then every ball goes into the hoop. Every time that ball goes into the hoop, they're perfecting the equation, rate times time equals distance. So we may not have been able to choose the right answer on the paper, but we certainly go out on a basketball court and do the equation and perfect it every time. When you sing a song and you sing it well, you couldn't even start that without a fraction. You, you can't even know math without knowing the halving process of the quarter note and the whole note and the half note and the whole note. All of that is mathematics. And linguistics, you start with a G clef. Every musician is a mathematician. But every mathematician is not a musician. Got a brother like Errol Grant. Never studied music in his life. All he had to do was play a tune from once and he could play that on the piano as if he had made the song himself. We got people that are blind. Stevie Wonder, <laughs> Ray Charles. Come on, you know, you gotta see our greatness. You, and you've gotta see why we're in the position that we're in. The only way they can make it is if our hands are tied. That's the only way they can make it. Because if you let us go, there's no holding us back. But now they're scared because they've been holding us back for 400 years. 
and we still rise. But what's happening in those 400 years that despite you holding me down, I'm still rising? In spite and despite of what you're doing, I'm becoming greater than you. Because in the time you're holding me down, you can't advance. Like I say, you put me in prison, you automatically in prison too. It's just that we are on different sides of the bars. Because you put me in prison, you must become my prison guard. Because if you leave, I'm right behind you. And because I know you put me in prison, I'm going to be moving quicker than you ahead of you. This is what our children face. This is what our community face. You've got to see why they're going to put us in prison. You've got to understand why they would create the Bloods and the Crips and then unite the gangs in California and get them to believe that there's a gang called the Bloods and the Crips. The Bloods and the Crips don't even exist. They're a figment of someone's imagination that united the gangs of California in order to sell drugs in order to be able to give the money to the Contras of Nicaragua. It's an illusion that we're living out here. The Bloods and the Crips don't exist, and all they've done is taking these children who yearn for family, who need that connection with something and someone, who will promise their lives to somebody, if you just be my father, be my mother. This whole idea of the nuclear family don't exist. The African family has never been a nuclear family. In fact, if any black man ever dared to be a father, they would immediately sell him. Because any man on the plantation that had the ability to have the children obey him is mightier than the so-called European plantation owner. At that point, you have to be sold because no one could be more powerful than the plantation owner. So even in our rise to greatness, we grew up without a nuclear family. So it can't be about the family. Otherwise, we would be destroyed, because we've never had one. Now, mind you, there are things that we as men of color, African men in particular, have to do for our families to support them, to nurture them, to sustain them. There's no question about that. But the reality of it is, is that don't they offer our women more money and welfare if the father is not at home? Yeah, Hasn't it always been encouraged for the black man not to be at home? Yeah, not, to be the one in, not to be the one that is part and parcel of the family? I mean, they set that up like that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way it's set up, to survive. It's always been encouraged for the person of color, the male, not to be at home, not to take that role. Now, there could have been a father that was actively involved with the children, no matter what, coming back and forth, but when it came time for the social worker to come, just tell him, Daddy, not here. But even that creates an atmosphere for children that we can't be surprised at what we see today all around us. Now, whether we let it happen, whether it was forced on us or not, is not the issue that we should take at hand. The issue that we should take at hand is the strategy to make it better. But you can't make a strategy without understanding the background. And what I'd like to do today is, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be very specific with what I say. And, and to do that, I'm gonna read directly from my notes, which I normally don't do. But I, as, I, as I've spoken to the grassroots production, I've told them that I would like to come back two more times uh, to get deeper into this. And what I see happening is I'm going to do a presentation now which is basically historically in, in place, which is content. The next time I come, we're gonna be very geography based. I'm gonna have this whole front filled with maps because you need to see where I'm talking about so you can get that geographic. Because time and space is key. Time is history, space is geography. But what I wanna do is I wanna lay the content material for you so that you can understand the, the material itself. The second time that I get a chance to come back, I'm gonna deal with the geography of it and I'm, I'm gonna show you the places that we're gonna be talking about so that you can geographically get these places in context. And then when I come back, I'm gonna tie everything together and I'm gonna show you the role that we played in this because we play a very big role in a lot of the conditions that we find ourselves in are not good and bad. Because you know, one thing I just like to tell you is that it was the Moors that taught the Europeans about slavery. Because you see, Africans had, had what they called uh, servitude. They had organized servitude. They had quite a system in place of servitude. Europeans had feudalism. And what happened was is that when the Moors, when Africans came into Europe with this organized servitude, the European took the organized servitude and superimposed it over their legal feudalism. And that legal feudalism became what would become slavery, and the mark of feudalism became complexion.
So we taught them how to do that. We taught them the gun. It was we that brought the fire stick into Europe. They didn't know nothing about guns. See, the Europeans at this time were an extremely ignorant people. Kings and queens were illiterate. They lived in barns. That's where chicken pox come from. Chicken pox come from humans living in the close proximity to chickens. And breathing the same air creates, over time, creates a disease within, which becomes communicable. Moors went in there said, <laughs> no. First, the first thing the Moor, the Africans brought in was soap. So, right. That's right. They said, I, before I even touch the land, we got to clean y'all up, because y'all a little funky up in here. <laughs> And then the Moors brought in something that they call Al-Kul, A-L-K-U-H-L, which today we call alcohol. Because they said, after we clean you up, we've got to disinfect you, because you're sick. Remember, this was the bu bubonic plague they had. They called it the Black Plague. They were dying. Neighborhoods were dying. And when Africans came in with soap, they came in with disinfectant, and they came in with Valencia oranges, olives, grapes, strawberries, all of the things that grow, because remember, Europe not doing these things. They didn't have them. And they didn't have the agricultural science to make it happen. We brought this in. We saved them so that they could do this to us. Because if we had just backed off for another 200 years, if the Visigoths and Vandals didn't get them, the disease would have. The reason why we sneeze today is because of that. We don't have communicable diseases. Native Americans don't have communicable diseases. Native Americans and Africans get sick by what comes from the outside and impacts them, like the tsetse fly or a mosquito. Okay, we get sick from something that comes out and infects us. European gets sick from inside. And they communicate it out. That's communicable diseases. And it seemed like the men had a fondness for sheep. <laughs> Yes. They got lonely up in them caves sometimes. Women and dogs didn't get lonely. That's right. That's right. And horses did wonders sometimes. <laughs> now we laugh and we joke, but please, brothers and sisters, understand this is a reality that these people lived in. And in Saudi, you go down to them pornographic stores, they still live in. Mm. Yes. Come on, you know, I mean, this is the reality. You know, this is unnatural for us. There was such a dynamic relationship between the African man and the African woman. I'm not saying it was we all got along, but we didn't dis, we did not not get along because somebody was a woman and somebody was a man. We just didn't get along because the vibrations weren't there. And that's human, that's human nature. You're not gonna get along with everybody. You will have your wars, but there's not gonna be something about you that makes me dislike you, except for the spirit that you emulate when you give that off, and that creates problems. And sometimes people who act, who act evil congregate together. Congregating together make you go against another group of people. So then you have people fighting each other, whether they be Native American or Asian or African, but it's not because of a complexion. It's not because of a gender. It's not because of any of the isms that we're living under today. It's not because of your religion. Because if that were the case, they would never have gotten on this land in the first place. We would not be celebrating this so-called misgiving day. There ain't nothing about Misgiving Day coming up here this Thursday afternoon. This was a seventh celebration of a harvest. Native Americans decided to invite these lonely, hungry people to eat. You know how you know it was a Native American celebration? Everything at the table was Native American. Turkey, corn, succotash. Everything that was eaten was Native American. So how are they gonna have a party for people that they don't even have those foods? The potato famine had nothing whatsoever to do with Ireland. What it was is that the Spaniards brought the potato of South and Central America back to Europe. And for a couple of generations, this potato grew. But then all of a sudden, the European land couldn't grow the potato anymore. So they had a famine. Today, you go to Jamaica, you want French fry, you got to ask for an Irish potato, a white potato. But that white potato originated. There are over 200 different kinds of potatoes in Central and South America that the Native American people grew. That's where the potato comes from. Potato comes from Central and South America. It does not come from Europe. Never did, never will. It doesn't grow there. Yet uh, the illusion is, is that the potato is the Irish potato, the Idaho potato. We don't know that was Native American. You have a, a, a gentleman by the name of Alberigo Vespucci, friend to Christopher Columbus, 
Portuguese, by the way. Right. Another thief. Yes, dilettante. Mm -hmm. Jumping around the world with other people's money, looking around for land. Heard that there's a whole bunch of gold down here in this place, this landmass called America. Because Columbus knew where he was going, by the way. You know, I could teach a child in first grade something that Columbus claimed he didn't know. You can't go east when you think you're going west. And vice versa. You just can't do that. Because all you got to do is wake up the next morning, see where the sun is setting, you know which direction you're going in. Why are we accepting this illusion about Columbus got lost? Columbus didn't get lost. He knew exactly where he was going. He had been in the enslavement trade with the Portuguese in 1482. He had been told by Africans who were coming back and forth from America that there was land to their west. And so on one of these occasions, he decided that he was going to change his faith system and change his name. He changed his name from Cristobal Colón to Christopher Columbus. Cristofo Colombo, claimed to have been born in general, which he might have been. But he was married all of his life. He was married and involved in Portugal. Yet we find him somewhere in the late 1400s involved in Spain. He was what is known as a Marano, someone who converts from the Sephardim to Christianity. And the reason why he converted religions is because right after they kicked the Moors out, they kicked the Jews out. Because they didn't want the Jews in there either, because there was a dynamic relationship between Africans and Jews, and why not? The Jews are Africans too. Oxford University. Say again, brother. Oxford University. Oxford University, Cambridge University, Salamanca, all of these universities. And there's some of these people that created Oxford and, and Cambridge, got hip, came to New York and developed something known as King's College. Columbia Today University. we call it Columbia University. Hmm. The people that formed that sat at our feet and learned the information. It was the Moors that learned Greek and Latin and taught these illiterate Europeans, Alfonso X in particular, how to speak Greek and how to speak Latin. That's where they were introduced to Greek and Latin. You know what I do in schools when people talk about Copernicus and Galileo. All I ever do is ask them one question and you can shut them up. They do what they call benign neglect. Make believe you're not in the room after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your hand can be up all this time. They don't even call on you because they know what's coming. All you gotta do is ask them. Where did they learn it from? That's all I want to know. Where did Galileo get his information from? Where did Copernicus get his information from? Where did Leonardo da Vinci get his information from? Where did Bach learn to play the piano? Come on, they didn't invent the piano. The, the piano is nothing but a harp turned sideways and encased in wood. That's why the piano is shaped like that, because it's a harp. Harp comes directly out of Africa, out of the family of quarterphones that the Moors brought in to Europe. Because you don't see nobody playing a piano back there in Europe. It's too cold. Where's the trees for the wood for the piano? The string. Where are the strings? Where are the animals where the strings come from? It's not there. These are the kinds of questions that, when asked, change the whole dimension of the conversation that you're having. Because people know they got to back off. That's why you got to become invisible in that room. Because if they entertain your comments, if they entertain your questions, that's it. It's over. But this is what we have got to know. And when we know it, we can teach our children. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend some time and then we'll um, uh, go for a break. I, I, I brought materials with me because brothers and sisters, there's no way that I could ever really teach, say everything that I'd like to say. So I brought materials that, 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 that at your leisure and as you see fit, you can contact me, you can purchase today, you can do whatever you'd like in terms of getting more information. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to break this up so that you can see certain areas. The first thing that I would talk about before I would talk about the Crusades themselves is I'd like to talk about the Roman Empire. You've got to understand the Roman Empire to understand what was going on. But in order to understand the future of the Roman Empire, you've got to understand Byzantium or the Byzantine center. Because the whole concept of what's happening amongst the Romans and amongst the Orthodox Christians and amongst the Africans is going to create Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire, or something known as Byzantium, which today we call, which was then taken by Const, uh, Constantine and made into what we what was called Constantinople, which became the capital of Byzantium, which today we call Istanbul, Turkey. See, all this is talking about Turkey in this particular area. But there's something in history that happens that splits the Catholic Church. And it all comes down to Revelation. 
Because the European has a thing about if they can't touch it and feel it and see it and smell it, it don't exist. So what was happening within the philosophical concepts of Christianity was they were moving away from the historical rev uh, relevance of this Christianity, which was the Amen priesthood, by the way. See, I don't see Christ as an individual person. I see Christ as a priesthood and a priestesshood that's revolting against the Roman army, attempting to recast or remake the Amen priesthood. That's where the word Amen plays such a prevalent role because Amen is an African word. It means the hidden. It doesn't mean so be it. And if you want to prove it, just go to a Latin dictionary and look up so be it. So be it is a sentence. It be so. Adverb, object, subject if you want it, and verb. It be so. If you looked that up in Latin, you wouldn't have amen. It's like if you go to Puerto Rico and if you want a ham sandwich, you ask for jamón, but you ask for sandwich. Because in, in Puerto Rico, there's no word for sandwich. So in a country where there's no word for something, all they do is take the word that it comes from, the place it comes from, and the word, and put it into the language. In Kiswahili, if you went to Tanzania and you wanted a sandwich, if they had one in the hotel, you would call it a sandwich. Because in Kiswahili, sandwiches are not there. So therefore, they took the word sandwich and they put it into the language. Same way when you look at the word agua, in Spanish. That wasn't the Spanish word for water. That's a Native American word, bagua. Bagua is the, uh, the Taino word for water. What the Spaniards did was took bagua, took the B off, and made it agua. And now we say agua thinking it's a Spanish word when it's a Native American word from the Taino or the larger family that they belonged to, which was known as the Arawak. That's why when, you, you know, when we're splitting ourselves up through language, we have to understand that you know, you could be hooked up from a whole nother perspective. Although many Taino do not exist anymore because of the destruction of the people, there are still some Taino that still remain in the Caribbean area. There were some that got on a boat and came to Florida. You got some Taino in Florida, just like you got some Cherokee in the Caribbean. That's why when you see people that look so Native American and they're not Taino, when a European was stealing the land of the Cherokee and the Eastern Coast and Native Americans, this comes down to us from Dr. Shashi McIntyre. Many of the Native Americans along that coast, from the north to the, uh, to the south, east coast, were exiled from the coast into the Caribbean. Same way when you go to like uh, uh, Portland and other places in the Caribbean where you see redheads. Well, those are the Irish that were exiled from Ireland to the Caribbean by the British. So you have a lot of people of Europeans and they've got that, they've, they, they, they've got the, they speak just like they Jamaican. And you're looking at them, you think that their name is O'Connor. Their name might be O'Connor, right. but they got that Jamaican sound of their language. They, they, they got the language down pat. And they say, but I'm Jamaican. And you wonder how, but they're Jamaican because they are the Irish that when British were taken over their land, they would exile them to parts of the Caribbean. And there were particular areas of the Caribbean that they were sent. But this is why there's such a relationship. Now, the story of ancient Rome really started off as a small community. And they came out of a, a group of shepherds, a community of shepherds in central Italy. And they became to their records as a great empire. But then they collapsed. And there's a reason why they collapsed. Just like this is going to collapse. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you, it's going to collapse. It's in the process of collapsing right now. As we speak, they're collapsing. That's why I'm telling you, stay out them bushes. <laughs> There's not an, well, let, I'll just leave that alone. But yeah, I mean, the reality of it is, is, you know, it is so obvious his background. It is so obvious what he's about. His brother himself said that. You know, and I mean, we gotta get this together because even I would dare say that, okay, we can point the finger all we want to at them, but even if they no longer existed, brothers and sisters, honestly, are we ready to take the leadership role on this planet? Yes, yes we are. And that's the question we have got to ask ourselves. If we are ready, then we've got to get this thing together. And we've got to make sure that our children are ready to accept this sacred legacy. Because we've got some things that we've got to do within our communities, within our homes, within our schools, within our hospitals. See, I have a problem with this thing about 100% Medicaid. Mm -hmm. See, my problem with this 100% Medicaid is that they plan on keeping 100% of us sick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
See, I'm ready to go back to the herbalist. I'm ready to go back to the juju doctor. <clears throat> Forget about going to the doctor. I don't want to go to Medicaid. I don't want you to give me a card that's going to keep me sick. I want to get healed. I want to go to a healer that's going to make my life a lot better than thinking that don't worry about it. When you get cancer, we'll take care of you. No, I want someone to tell me I'm not going to get cancer. According to Roman legend, the city of Rome, now remember, um, I was in a discussion once, okay, let, let, let's say it like this. I was in a discussion once where someone, you know, was trying to be funny. It was a person of European descent. And they made a comment like I was like, like, like I belong to a monkey's uncle. They were trying to insinuate the Africanness, the, the, um, the level of hominid and hominoid. And they were making it seem as if I was related to the monkey. And so I had no problem with that as long as they were willing to admit that they were a son of a bitch. <laughs> and I was valid in my point. And the reason why I say this is because the ancient story of Romulus and Remus, according to the myth, is that Romulus and Remus suckled at a she-wolf's breast. Yes. Okay? Now, I can't... Now, she-wolf to me is a female dog. Right. And you know what they call a female dog. So if, in fact, my history comes from the gorilla, then their family comes out of a she-wolf. And this is in their story. That their mother, Romulus and Remus, came from a she-wolf. And that Romulus and Remus fought each other. And Remus lost. Romulus won. And so the capital of this central Italian area became Rome. If Remus had won, Rome would be called Reim. That's why it's called Rome, because of Romulus. Romulus and Remus. Now, this is nothing but a contamination of the story of Cain and Abel, of Asar and Satan. They haven't invented anything new, because remember, the Greeks taught the Romans. In fact, the Greek slaves were enslaved to teach the illiterate Romans. Most of the Romans were illiterate. They got their intelligence from the people they enslaved. <coughs> now, by 275 BC, this small area of Rome that started in 753 BC, by 275 BC, it controlled most of the Italian peninsula. Think of it, the Italian peninsula. This is where they're starting, as shepherds now. But see, the thing about these is that these are warriors. Keep this in mind. They're very aggressive. And remember, they're shepherds. So you know who they're taking care of. They're sheep. Remember what we said about the sheep. So this is the beginnings of this contamination. Okay. At its peak in the 100s AD, the Roman Empire covered about half of Europe, much of what they call the Middle East, and the north coast of Africa. The empire then began to crumble, partly because it was too big for Rome to govern. You see, they never were able to get the pharaonic system of education in place. They never were able to get that because everybody that they took up underneath them, they fought them and they made them angry. So there were always plots and planning. Even when you look at Oct Octavian and Mark, Mark Anthony, you see them constantly plotting against each other. There is something in Rome known as the Cronus Complex. The Cronus Complex, K-R-O-N-O-S, or however you might want to spell it, but it's Cronus, which means that the concept is, is that the father will do better than his father, but will make sure that his children can't do better than him. This is why you have so many children killing their father in their world, because they're trying to take over constantly from their father. This is where Shakespeare gets the whole Oedipus complex from. Yes. The See, the whole, the whole underpinning of this is coming out a contaminated version of what they never really understood coming from African people. And so when, you, when you're looking at this historically, this is why it's important that Dr. Clark taught us. One of the best ways to find out about African history is to learn European history. Mm. And we must not just not pay attention to that because of what we want to know about ourselves, because much of what we want to know about ourselves is embedded in their history. And so this is under his direction why my master's degree is not in African history, it's in European history. Because he told me, I'll teach you about Africa. Let them teach you about Europe. And what I found out about them, I'm telling you, this is not hard for us to do. 
But it is absolutely impossible if you're living in illusion. Because remember, that whole thing about the whiz. Remember the Wizard of Oz. See, the wizard was nothing but a small man projecting a large image on the wall. That's what scared everybody. But when that little dog Toto pulled back the screen and everybody saw that was a little man, nobody had a problem dealing with him anymore. But the, the worst thing was, it was the first time everybody found out that he couldn't help. You had to do it yourself. And when the good witch came down, actually what the good witch merely explained to them, she was a facilitator, just like I say about a good student. All the good witch said, you remember Lena Horne when she came down and saying, you got to believe in yourself? All she told them, she told a lion. She said, look, you want courage. When you defended everybody there, you had courage. Told the tin man that wanted a heart. When you were willing to do what you did, you showed that you had a heart. Scarecrow wanted a brain. He said, when you devised a plan, you showed that you had a brain. And Dorothy, all Dorothy wanted to do was go home. Isn't that like us? Isn't that story us, though? All Dorothy wanted to do was go home. She said, well, all you have to do is click your heels three times and say, I want to go home. That's all we got to do. And what's stopping us from clicking our heels to go home is the illusion of the wizard projecting himself on the wall as a big man. Because the European is not what they pretend to be. Yes. Not at all. And I've been play and I don't need to say, because I'm sure many of you have been in their presence before. They're not who they pretend to be. But the illusion, you know, when you want to take over a people, there are three steps. There's creation of the myth, there is getting people to believe the myth, and then it's make forming, making them form the habit of believing the myth. And while it's always the last form that's always the hardest to get rid of, the habit. See, because we don't believe the myth anymore. But we so busy have formed the habit of believing it, we're living it. It's like Carter G. Woodson said that, you know, we've been going in the back door so long that if there, that we went to a house that didn't have a back door, we'd build it just to go through the back door. We don't need the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. We don't need a third party. All we need to do is be conscious. It's not about getting your foot in the door. See, I'm, I, I believe a lot in the words that we speak. That's why to Africa, word is so important. The word, children say word up. Word is very important. The concept of getting your foot in the door gives you the impression that you're not in the building yet. I'm telling you, not only don't you have to get your foot in the door, you're already in the house. All you gotta do is find the light switch and turn the light on. Think about it. This room was in pitch black, darkness. It would be very difficult to see anything in this room. But if you turn the light on, you'd see everything and everybody. Nothing new has come in this room. It's just you didn't see it before because your light was out. We're living in illusion. There's no Messiah. There's no special organization. There's no president that's going to be elected. Have no fear, even if we do get into the bushes. Have no fear. We dealt with Reagan. And if you can deal with Reagan, you can deal with anybody, because that brother had Alzheimer's disease when he was president. <laughs> he did. That's why every time he used to say he don't recall, he wasn't lying. He didn't recall. He didn't know who he was sometimes. He used to wake up and say, oh, am I president? <laughs> People said that. This man had Alzheimer's disease when he was president of the United States. I don't worry about the president. I never worry about the people in the position. I don't worry about people in powerful positions. I con I'm concerned about people with positions of power. It's the people behind him that got the power. He's nothing but a figurehead. All they had to do with Reagan was just keep waking him up before the cameras came. That's all they had to do. Wake up now. Play your part. You're president. He said, yeah, I'm president. Another pill. Yeah, get him up. And he, bang. He was good, you know. He was real good. In fact, I dare say that was the best part he ever played. <laughs> now that I would have given him an Academy Award for. When he became president, he went from a B actor to an A actor. Because he was good. He played that part real good. It was an illusion. We don't have to worry about Bush. We don't have to worry about gore. Look at what we've been through. We've been through Washington. 
We've been through Jackson and Johnson. We've been through Buchanan, the other Buchanan. We've been through them all. And look at where we are. Oh, look, we've been through Giuliani, so hey. <laughs> I mean, think about it. But see, they'll have you scared. They'll create an illusion of fear around you so that you're really going to think something negative is going to happen. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. No matter who becomes president, we're still going to be facing the same situation. And the only thing that's going to change is us. I don't care who becomes president. I could care less who becomes president. In fact, if Bush becomes president, he's going to be really much on his P's and Q's. He's going to have to be. With all that they say about Clinton, he has done nothing for the masses of our people. Not a thing. In fact, we're in a worse position now than we were when he first started. Now, he's taken a couple of us, given us a little bit of something. But see, this is an illusion that we're living out here. Once we get this together and we see for ourselves what's going on, we will revolutionize this thing. And we don't have to worry about who's leading us. I'm talking about the African, the African-American <clears throat> leaders. We, we, we don't have to worry about them either because they're very predictable too. And all you gotta do is look at the pattern and you'll see the predictability of them. The only thing that will change will be us. That's what freed us in Haiti. That's what freed us in America. It wasn't the leaders. It wasn't even the abolitionists. It was the masses of African people like Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, yeah, we can do, that called to arms. All of them. They came up out of the community and said, no more. Alton Maddox, if you want to get to the present. All of them have said, no more. We're going to take a stand. And the system has created a cloud of fear around them so that people are afraid to walk in that cloud. But once you get brave enough to walk into that cloud, things will change by quantum leap. People will change differently towards you. Didn't they change towards Minister Farrakhan after the Million Man March? Richly. Very quickly. Even Newt Gingrich said, when you see so many people out there, something must be going <laughs> It's right in front of us. They saw people coming together and saying, no more. They saw brothers congregate, more than three, without one of them in the crowd. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> they said, something's up in the hood. And something was up, you know. And that's the bottom line. We said no more, and we meant it, and we made a change. I have literally, as a father of children, um, I, I have a child now in junior in high school, Sasha's junior. I have a child that is in the seventh grade, and I have a, two daughters, and my son, our son, is in first grade. When I used to go to open school night for my oldest daughter, who was in the early grades, I, and this was prior to 1995, that um, some, I would go in and I would just see the teacher right there. And when I would sign the attendance sheet, there might be three or four names in front of me. The Me and Man March occurred in October. The first open school night normally is in November. Like, it's coming up this week. I'll be going to my children's school. That next November, from that October to that November, when I went there, the school was crowded. There were fathers there. Remember what everybody, particularly I remember Jesse Jackson giving five things that every family should do in terms of school. And one of them was to attend your child's open school night for report cards. This was a directive that he gave. And I saw fathers. And see, I'm a living witness of this, so this is not something that I heard about or I, or I read about. This is something that I've experienced. And it's the same school, by the way. It's not like it's a different school. There were more fathers. There were more parents in there. And over the years, what I have noticed is that not only don't I, sometimes I don't even get to see the teacher because there's so many people there. Remember before, I used to just walk in and I could see the teacher. Now, I have to wait online, not just that. When I go to sign the attendance sheet, sometimes I gotta turn the sheet back because there's so many people's names on the attendance sheet. There is a change. I see more African men with their children now than I've ever seen before. In places I go, I see this myself. Is it happening quickly? Is it happening the way I want it? No, but it's happening. It's happening. It's a process. Yes, and that's what we've gotta focus on. Don't become disenchanted because it's not happening in our time. 
because the ancestors and the creator is controlling time. It's in the creator's time, not our time, but the process of what I'm seeing happening is happening. And I remember the Muslims used to walk the street back in the day and they say that the white man's heaven is the black man's hell. But if that be true, then the black man's heaven is the white man's hell. And so that when these individuals see so many fathers and mothers coming to check on their children. Now I'm not saying everything is wonderful. I'm not trying to get to that. That's not the point. The point that I'm saying is I see change. change. And where you see change, you see alteration in behavior. And that's why you see the educational system doing what it's doing now. That's why you have a lawyer who is chancellor. Having our present chancellor is like someone appointing me to be the head of the Supreme Court judge. That's what I like. Now, I'm supposed to make decisions for the courts now. I'm an educator. How are you going to have a lawyer making decisions for education? He never spent his time in classroom. He said the only connection he had with the classroom was he returned to the classroom that he, he went to. He never taught a classroom before. What does he know about education? What does he know about the fundamental principles of educating children? He don't know nothing about that. He spent, he, I spend my time in classroom like he spent his time in the courtroom. What does he know about education? What makes him fit to become? We were better off with uh, Wagner. Remember, we chased him out because he didn't have a degree. But he taught at Hunter College. So at least he was a teacher. This man not a teacher. Is it by accident? No. Are they failing? No. The Board of Ed is not failing. They're succeeding. Because their purpose is to miseducate our children. We're living under the illusion that they're trying to educate our children. So when they talk about this program and that program, we say, well, they're trying. No, they're not trying. What they're doing is perfectly sensible to me. Because with all that we've said so far, if we were to get into the classroom and be able to perform in the classroom, we would do in the classroom what Michael Jordan did in basketball, what Tiger Woods did in golf, what the Williams sisters did in tennis. We would revolutionize the method of educating to the point where they could not test our children because they would not be on the level of intellectual excellence that our children would be on. Like I said, this test does not test your intelligence. It only, it only measures how well you take a test. You have children who do very poorly on the test, but go out and perform what they didn't do well on the test. Do they know the material? Yes, but they just know it in a different form. They know it kinesthetically instead of physically. To take a test and to look at H, uh, R times T equals D, rate times time equals D, is a way of knowing something. To be able to work that formulation out is a way of knowing something. To be able to bubble in the answer out of the four is a way of being able to respond to what you know. But my question is what you're going to do with it. And if you can't do something with it, you wasted your time learning it. We are under the illusion that what's good. I don't send my children to school to become educated. I send them to socialize. I educate my children. So I'm not disappointed when my, my children come home and say, we don't have homework. Because <laughs> I got homework for you. Oh, wow. I got the homework for you. Forget that. You're home now. I got the homework for you. It's the socialization that I'm trying to get my children to get to. I'm trying to get them to learn how to work with and deal with other children, other people. Don't be selfish because when you're home alone, then things are done for you. But when you go out, then you see how you are within relationship to everything around you. That's why my children go to school. Not because I expect the Board of Ed to teach them something, because I know that they're not. But I know that they can't, because that is not the purpose of school. Because what they're doing up in here is indoctrination. The whole model of education is indoctrination. It's built on an agricultural model. I mean, who said that between 9 and 3, that's when children should go to school? Who said they should have July and August off? That had nothing to do with, that's, that has to do with the farm. Children could work the farm in the morning, go to learn how to read, to write, and to calculate because of the Industrial Revolution that was on the road. They needed office managers. They need people who work the machines because they could see. The Carnegies and them could see what, what, what the future held. And so they needed to read, to write, and to calculate, to become office managers. Not to think. That wasn't the purpose. Not to invent. That wasn't the purpose. 
And so in 1909, the Carnegie Commission came up with this idea that the children would go to school from approximately 9 o'clock to about 1.30. By the way, there was no free lunch at this time. You carried your own brown bag or you didn't eat. Or you ate heavy breakfast or late heavy lunch. <laughs> they didn't have no food for you. That, that came from a brother by the name of Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. That's when that free lunch came. And they modeled it after the African Freedmen's Bureau. The public school system was based at, over the African Freedmen's Bureau. How did African people educate their children after 1865? That's what became the model for the public school system. See how heavy we are? Now, there were Europeans in the African Freedmen's Bureau. I'm not saying that. In fact, the leaders were. But like all other operations that we're a part of, you may have a white general but it's the people underneath the general that ran the show. So it was the Africans that formulated this program of how to educate children with people's money. Rich people would give money, and Africans would cut up that money and create schools. That concept of the money coming in from a central location became the government's job in the public school educational system, which was then channeled through Carnegie and all of the other rich people to turn of the century who were part of the Industrial Revolution. And so when that occurred, they said, okay, we'll let the children stay with you from when the sun comes up to about 9 o'clock. They'll stay with us from about 9 to about 1.30, 2 o'clock, and then we'll return them back to the farm so they can help you close your day out. And then we'll give them July and August off so that you can reap what you sow. But it had nothing to do with pedagogy. It had nothing to do with education. It had nothing to do with how long. And they said 44 minutes seems to be the amount of time someone needs to learn. So now we have periods that are 44 to 48 minutes long. It has nothing to do whatsoever with how much time. Children can learn something in four seconds. Some four minutes, some 44 minutes, some four days, some yes. four years. Yes. Learning is a very unique kind of relationship that happens when the time is right. What you need is a facilitator. Someone of the caliber of Professor John Henry Clark, or a Dr. Ben, or a Shashi McIntyre. Carter G. Woodson or William Leo Hansberry, one of those brilliant, and I'm sure that we know them, I'm not trying to throw out names because I would spend the rest of the day throwing out names of brilliant educators. Because an educator doesn't have to be in the, in the area of education. There have been brilliant uh, people in education in every walks of life. Whether you be a doctor or a lawyer, whether you are, are, you are a tailor, no matter what, everything, the transmission of information is a teacher, your yeah, teaching. Yeah. J.A. Rogers is another brilliant educator. We could call these out in the litany of our saints who have come before us and who are still with us now, who have been great teachers. But teaching is not something that you go to school to learn. You may learn content information, but the art of teaching is something that comes out of you. And some of the most brilliant educators I've ever been in the presence of never went to school. Uh, Chancellor Williams taught me that the, that the one person that channeled his life and made him understand was an ex-slave known as Jed. And Jed used to get up underneath a tree in, in Dr. Williams' old hometown and would start talking. And Dr. Williams said that he was so fascinated by this man who had never been to school and everybody talked about him that he would just sit before this man and just learn. He said he knew there was something about this man that was just brilliant. And so this ex-slave Jed was the one that brought Chancellor Williams, who became who he became. It was he who brought him through the whole process of learning and knowing. It wasn't a PhD. It wasn't someone with all them alphabets after their name. It was someone who had never been to formal school, but who was brilliant. And by the way, the first person that gave someone a PhD didn't have a PhD. Right. How about that? How about that? How about that? <laughs> you know, in fact, the way the PhD was formed in the United States is a group of them gave themselves PhDs. They just sat around and gave each other PhD, and then they became the core of people who gave others PhDs. <laughs> this is all an illusion that we're under. We could sit here and give each other PhDs. That's what I tried to get to our community. That, that um, program that Dr. Jeffries had spearheaded, that George Edward Tate became the administrative principal for, and that in, in her moving past this form into the next form, Dr. Sharshi McIntyre, this was one of her last great um, uh, contributions to our community was the Cum University that worked out of Clark House. And one of my beliefs always was is that that should have become our institution. That should become our way that we give each other, we validate ourselves. Yes. 
Okay, just because you get a, a, a piece of paper from a school that says you have this, if you don't value that, it's not that. But if you sit before Professor Clark or Dr. Ben, and you so respect that educator, you so love that educator, that they give you a piece of paper that they just write on it, you've sat in front of me and you got a PhD. If you value that as a PhD, you are a PhD. Not because the paper said it, but because you value that paper and that individual that taught you something. Then you go out and you teach, and you teach what that person taught you, and that's your validation. And again, going back to what Wade Noble said about power. Someone said, you well, that's not a PhD. I would say, yes, it is. He gave it to me, and it's a PhD. They said, no, it's not a PhD. I you just to ask them this. Prove that it's not a PhD. And they can't because it's only their word against your word. And if you're not part of their illusion, then that's a PhD to you. And that's the point we have to get to, the point that we respect our own. The fact that if someone just writes down, forget about it being on sheepskin, they go back in with them sheep. You see, they, they can't get rid of them sheep. They need the sheep all over them. We have got to do as a people. Grassroots Productions develops a, a workshop series that at the end of, a, let's say, of a 13 workshop series, they decide to make this something that you will get a formal piece of paper saying you've been in attendance for 13, you are capable of so and so. If you are capable of so and so, that validates you are who you say you are. And I would dare anyone to come and tell you that you're not. They couldn't do it. This is the world that we're living in. And this is what we've got to do. This information is revelatory. It is free. But we've got to do this. It's not up to anybody else out here to do this. Now, when we look at the land, ancient Rome arose on seven wooded hills along what is known as the Tiber River. Again, we're talking about in central um, Italy. It grew sometimes to be between 50 and 70 million people at its height. Of that number, nearly one million people lived in Rome and five to six million lived in other parts of Italy. The peoples in Mesopotamia, Palestine, Egypt, and Greece had cultures that were far older than Rome, but even they will admit that Britain, Germany, and Gaul, Gaul is basically where France is today, parts of Romania up in that area there, Gaul, G-A-U-L. Gaul were introduced to more advanced civilization by the Romans. In other words, the Romans learned from the Greeks, the Greeks learned from the Chemites. Chemites learned from the Ethiopians. So if that be true, that means that Britain, Germany, and Gaul were introduced to this newer information from Rome, but really, when you go back to it, Western civilization is built on the knowledge of Africa. The ancient people of Rome were divided into various social classes. Very few Romans belonged to the upper classes. See, this is nothing but capitalism right here now. See, it's inbred in them from the very beginning. Only a few are at the top. That's the only way the system can work. But the job of the few is to create an illusion for the many. Members of the Senate and their families made up the most powerful upper class group. Now look at the government. And who are the most powerful people? The people who have relationships with the businesses, which were to be formed what they call equities, equities. Equities in Rome were the prosperous landowners and business people. So what's happening is that the Senate or the government is creating relationships with the business people, they're creating connections between them so that the politicians enact things for the business people. It's the same model that we have today. The head of the uh, Roman household was what was known as pater familias. In other words, this is where they're going from the matrilineal to the patrilineal. See, because even the Greeks, although they were very male-oriented, they still were leaning towards the women of the community in, uh, to give the social power. But the social power under the Romans began to change. And only these children went to school. They didn't send children to school. Children didn't go to school. You work with your family in Rome. And it was forbidden for women to learn rhetoric which was the language of politics, you see, rhetoric. You know, like for us, as like when, when, when brothers get together, right, and, and sisters, but I'm going to deal with the brothers. 
And, and we talk nonsense, right? We say, that, that's bullshit, okay? You could say that to a person of European descent, they will take no offense to you. But if you say to a person of European descent, that's rhetoric, they, they will get very offended at you. The same way brothers get offended if you say that they're BSing is the way they feel towards rhetoric because that's what rhetoric is. Rhetoric is BS. Rhetoric is the manipulation of words to mean something else. And that's what their government is based on. Look at the government today. The reason why I'm going through this is because I want you to see how nothing has changed. That the mindset that they had in ancient Rome, coming out of those seven wooded hills around the Tiber River, is as much a part of our world today as it was back then, based around rhetoric. And rhetoric is lies that sound good. And that's what this government is based on. Even well-meaning people that get into politics speak rhetoric because you're not getting elected if you tell the truth. Because to tell the truth means, I am gonna tax you, I am gonna build prisons, I'm gonna make sure black folk get in them, I'm gonna make sure youth of European descent are the ones that build the prisons. That's what they'd have to tell you. Because even the well-meaning ones sign bills and action that make that happen. The religion, the earliest uh, Romans believed that gods and goddesses had power over agriculture and all aspects of daily life, coming directly out of the comedic legacy. The problem between the Romans and the Greeks were like the bridge. The problem between the Romans and the Chemites was that the Chemites understood the difference between myth and reality. The Romans did. One of the reasons why the Romans really were after the Christians was because they blamed the Christians for the bad luck the Romans got because they said Christians did not give uh, credit to Roman gods and goddesses. The fact that they were based around agriculture also shows you the relationship between the Chemites and the Romans. Because everything was based around, almost all of their gods and goddesses is based around uh, the aspect of uh, agricultural life. Even our school system, just like we said before. Okay. If I, if I can just stop now and ask uh, how much time we have, because I've gone on and on. I feel like I can go on another 12 hours. I want to be careful uh, right. before we make our break. Yeah. Let me finish up with my ideas of the Romans, then we're going to get into the Byzantine and we'll get into the uh, Crusades. Okay. During the 300s, the Romans came into increasing contact with Greek ideas. Okay, this is the takeover now. They then began to worship Greek gods and goddesses, and they gave them Roman names and built temples and shrines in their honor. Now here's the challenge, is the challenge is that they honestly believed that there wasn't, now I'm using this as a metaphor. It's like if we told a story of Little Red Riding Hood and we actually believed there was a wolf that ate the grandmother that was in the bed waiting for Little Red Riding Hood to come. They took a Greek metaphor and they made it a real story. So therefore, if you didn't go along with their story, you were hurting the gods and the goddesses. It's like if I didn't believe, if I chose not to believe Santa Claus, I would be punished for it. They say there is a Santa Claus, and he's coming down that roof. I don't care if you live in a project and you don't have a roof. He's coming down there. You say, but there's, there's, no, there's no chimney. They say, don't argue with me. He's coming down your chimney. And they would punish you if you didn't believe it. This is the metaphor for what I'm trying to get us to see. It is the same thing that that witch hunting was based after. You see, because the reason why the pilgrims were kicked out was not because of religious persecution. That's not why they were kicked out. The people that came here were Europeans who burned women at the stake. Because burning women at the stake was going on in Europe for years. Another thing is that um, people who lived alternative lifestyles, but, but particularly men, the way in which they would punish a man who lived in an alternative lifestyle, in other words, who was homosexual, they would make them go through the community and get the sticks. And you know you call sticks faggots. They would make them go and pick up the sticks that they then would burn them at the stake. And so pretty soon, the idea or the word faggot, which means little sticks or twigs, became known as the individual that was going out to collect them. And so the two entities that were persecuted in Europe were women and men who led alternative lifestyles, particularly men who led alternative lifestyles. 
so that when the governments of Europe saw this going on, they kicked them out of Europe and sent them to America. The people that came to America then said, you're after me because of religious persecution. They weren't after them because of religious persecution. They were after them because they were crazy. Because they built a religion around burning people at the stake. And it just wasn't women and people who lived alternative lifestyles. It was anybody that they disagreed with. It was anybody that didn't go along with their belief system. They would burn them at the stake. So they took huge communities of people like this and moved them into America. And then one of the biggest communities happened to be in Salem, Massachusetts. But Salem, Massachusetts, prior to that, was a Moorish town. That's where you get the word Salam, or Salem. You saying it was a Moorish town? Yes, it was, a, it was an African town. The Moors have been here for a very long time. Moors have been in I don't ever know a time. Um, I'd, I'd be careful uh, to really make any dates on it, but Africans, North Africans, Northwest Africans, have been in America for centuries. Came before Columbus? Long before. There's evidence of Ramses III on the Mississippi River. Okay. Well, the key about, yes, in, um, um, uh, in Ohio, Davenport, Ohio, you have a whole Egyptian stele there. Uh, in parts of America, you have great relationship between, but see, keep in mind that Moors don't mean Muslim. Moors mean black. So you have Moors of many different faith systems in America that date back in time, and you have Native American peoples in Africa. And say again? And in Cuba. And in Cuba. You have, you see, the thing is, is that, again, with this illusion, we have been made to believe yes. that everything happened after 1492. Yes. What we don't know is that the major trade routes that Africans that came into Europe were the same trade routes that Europeans escaped from. It's just like most of the pad, most of the roads in America, the major highways, underneath those major highways are Native American pads. Original. Say again? The originals from Peru to Alaska. And exactly. You, and you can see all of the major roads are there. The whole subway system is built on the way Africans built tunnels in North Africa when the Sahel was being formed. There's evidence of tunnels under the... Um, under the Sahel or underneath the desert, Sahara. And that when they would come up for air, because every so often, you know, after days of traveling underground, you've got to come up for air. They would create what today we call oases, a place where they could water, get water, get fruit, feed the animals that were on the caravan. And these underground pads had the reflection of the above ground pads because when the Sahel or the Sahara was a green land, they used the grasslands or the fertile land just to go across. But you see, when someone defines your reality, you lose sight of your greatness. Yes, yes. And so the stories that they tell us now about ourselves, you know, like when I tell children, children look at me like, oh, Mr. Coleman, you know, I, you know, they've never been taught this before. They have, they have no conceptual framework of Africans and Native Americans the mound builders, all along the Mississippi River. There are over 130 pyramids along the Mississippi River. Today they're called mounds. Sister, okay. we're going to have a question and answer period where you can ask your questions. Yeah, I'll try to keep them on the subject. Yeah. I know, I'm getting, you know, because I do this sometimes. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and you know, it's all according to the form of the way in which I present, because sometimes I like the interaction. Yeah. Uh, but, but sometimes, because of taping, sometimes that changes. Uh, what I encourage you to do is please write down whatever right. question that, that you may have. You're going to have an hour for questions and answers. Yeah, and, and I'm here. I'm here. We, we, we're going to do this here. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm here to sun up, sun down, you know. Uh, because I, I, we have years to be able to make this happen, you know. So uh, we'll be able to do this. But what we're going to do is have a break. And then we'll be able to, uh, you know, I'll be here and I'll have the material here. Because during the break, we'll have a chance to talk and you'll be able to come over. Uh, but there's so much of our history. And this is not the last time. We, we have generations and years to be together. And if we do the right thing, we'll hand this down to our children to do. Uh, but there is so much that we should know about ourselves. So much of the relationship that we should know about ourselves. And that long before we integrate even... See, this was... Uh, with all the respect I've had for all of those that have come before us, and I do have great respect for any of us who are still around, before you can ever even think about integrating with someone of European descent, we've got to integrate with ourselves, our people. 
Yes, sir. And before we even integrate with ourselves, we got to integrate with ourselves. Yes, sir. Who we are. This is why in ancient Kemet it always said, know thyself. Yes. Know where you come from. Know yourself in relationship to the cosmos. Each and every one of us is a piece of the cosmos. This is why the Kemetic origin of the universe is something I stress. Who are you in the universe? You are a microcosm of the macrocosm. You are all little universes walking on this planet. You are all, each and every one of us. Don't look outside to pray to God. Don't even look inside to pray to God. You are God. Each and every one of you is God. And every book says that. That so God lo so loved and wanted to know him herself that he created beings that would then reflect back to the God. And that's who we are. So you don't have to go to anybody to ask them to pray to God for you. All you got to do is have a conversation with yourself. You make things happen for yourself. And that's not sacrilegious. And I know a lot of folk, they, they find that rather radical. But when you know who you are and what you've achieved and your essence of, of who you are, and the fact that really the way in which you honor God is how you treat the least of our people. Because you know, when I read the Bible and all the holy books, particularly the Bible, I never heard Christ say he's going home. I never heard his apostles say, I was hanging out with Christ at his house. So Christ must have been homeless. How do we feel about the people out in the street that don't have a home? And you know, you have to understand that this brother was considered radical. For his day, this brother was talking stuff. He was talking revolution. Most of the people didn't want a revolution. They wanted to go along with it. Them Romans would have come in with their spears. This brother was talking about revolution. This brother was talking about, you don't have to take this nonsense from these Romans. Who do these Romans think they are? They're not even in their land. What they coming in here telling us what to do? He, he's in Egypt now, talking to other Africans. He's saying, we've got, an, we've got a priesthood. And our priesthood got it going on. We belong to the Essenes. We are the first priests and priestesses of the order of Melchizedek. Now, who do these people that tell us what's going on? We are. We can do whatever we want. Romans say, we got to get rid of that guy. That guy's a teacher. Christ wasn't a religious leader. He was a teacher. That's who they were after. Romans killed teachers. They didn't kill religious leaders. And Christ was saying, you know, you are your own God. Why are you letting these people come in and treat you like this? So they set him up. They put the brother on a horse or on a donkey on Palm Sunday, and they laid palms at his feet to let him know. You, you, you know what the mafia does to you before they even get ready to execute you? They, they laid palms at his feet. And the next and see, I'm speaking in the metaphor now. <clears throat> next week, on Friday, on Thursday. Brother knows what's going down now because the brother knows the pattern in the tabernacle. And the brother's saying, these people are coming after me now. And you know something else? Not only are they coming after me, but the person that's going to turn me in is one of my boys. One of my boys is going to, and one of my closest boys. Because the one thing they don't tell you about Judas is that Judas was Christ's best friend. Yes. Judas saying, you know, man, you're talking this revolution, brother, but you're hanging out with these folk. So we're gonna have to put the chill on you. So he goes. And so this symbol of Christ goes into the garden for this last prayer. And he says, please, if you can just let what's gonna happen. He said, I know what's gonna happen to me. If you can just let this pass, let this cup pass over my head. I appreciate that. Something occurred to him when he realized that he was part of destiny. Something like Martin Luther King the night before he died. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, too, when you consider who was around him. Malcolm X is another brother. Fanny Lou Hamer is another sister. We can go down the line. And so the brother, he, he, he brings some of his other brothers, some of his closest brothers, some of the 12. He said, listen, man, I know what's going to happen, but if you all will just stand guard, just stand guard for me. And so he goes in and he does his little thing, and he comes out, and what? The brothers sleep. He said, come on, brothers. So this is the last night you and I are going to be together. Couldn't you at least stay up just to protect me? So, and then he woke to sleep out there. They said, yeah, okay, you go ahead back. We'll take care of him. He goes back to give his second message. When he comes out, the brothers sleep again. Mm -hmm. This is a metaphor now. Because you see, while you're in here, 
Our brothers and sisters outside sleep. This is a metaphor. This is for you not to get concerned about them sleep because what's going to happen is going to happen anyway. It's going to happen. This is all part of a much larger plan. The universe is cleansing its blood system. And we are all part of this divine plan. There are some of us who are in the know, and there are some of us who are not in the know. None of us are to be hurt whether we know or not. We just all must play our part in this. And so now, his second best friend, Patah, or Peter, he says to Christ, he said, you know, I don't know about them two guys there, man. He said, but uh, I got your back. He said, I'm your boy. I'm your ace. Christ said, you need to be quiet. Because before the cock crows, you're going to deny you even know me three times. You see the message? How many people out there will embrace you behind closed doors, but will walk past you when you need them? It goes back to that saying, where my dog's at. <laughs> Young people got it together, where my dog's at. Where are my dogs at? When you need them the most, who has the courage? Who has the courage to really do what I... So don't be surprised at a chosen few. When you go to meetings, don't be surprised that there's not a lot of folk here because many, many are called, but few are chosen. So don't be surprised that you don't have all these folk behind you. And don't be surprised that the ones that swear by you are the ones that pass you when you need them the most. Don't be surprised, because that story's already been told to us. Oh, yes. And that story is nothing but a retold story of Asar and Seton, which goes back to ancient Kemet. This is a part of human nature that we're experiencing. But in time, all will be said and done. Okay. What I'd like to do is I'd like to move just into the ending of the uh, Romans to, to have you understand that mining was one of ancient Rome's most important activities. Now keep in mind, the story I just told you is directly rooted in what I'm telling you here, because this is the mindset that's being created that further and will later develop this. The empire's great building projects required large supplies of marble and other materials. Marble came from Greece and Northern Italy. Italy also had copper and rich deposits of iron ore. Most of the empire's gold and silver came from Spain. Now why? There's not, say again? That's right, came from the Moors. Because Spain does not have rich deposits of gold and silver. So where did they, if it did come from Spain, it didn't come from the land of Spain, it came from the Moors of Spain, that got it from Kemet, that got it from Nubia, that came out of Ethiopia and the, and the northwest parts of Africa. Ghana, Mali, Songhai. So, that, so that's where that gold came from. Mines in Britain produced lead and tin. See, all they got is this lead, tin, iron ore, and things like that. Work in the mines was hard and unhealthful. The Romans forced slaves, condemned prisoners, and uh, condemned criminals, and prisoners of war and prisoners of war to work in the mines. Now, um, the, Greek, the ancient Romans made very few scientific discoveries. And why? Because they didn't have brain power. Much of what they got, they got from the Greeks. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the fall of Rome. Because the fall of Rome is very important in terms of what's going on. Marcus Aurelius becomes emperor in 161 AD. He defended the Roman Empire against attacks by Germanic tribes from the north and Parthians from the east. See, the Parthians from the east would later become the lighter complexion Muslims that would, that would be brought into Islam. There is a distinct difference between Saddam Hussein and Sheikh Hunter Jio. Let's make it plain. The lighter complexion peoples of Persia and, I and I uh, Iraq and Iran and those areas there are different Muslims from the Muslims of Ethiopia and Africa. Islam, Islam, as told to me by Senegalese, came out of Ethiopia when the Prophet Muhammad blessings on that brother's name. His mother was Ethiopian, his grandmother was Ethiopian. And when you look at the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Africa, it's the same people. If you look at the African presence in early Asia, a book edited by Ivan Rent Sertima, you'll see the relationship that this was an African peninsula, Saudi Arabia. And that the later peoples, the tribes that would come later, the lighter complexion, 
the, uh, for lack of a better word, let, let's call them Aryans, although Arius was an African, but let's just call them the lighter complexion peoples coming up out of the mountains, they later would come down and they would, be em they would embrace uh, Islam or the language of Arabic, which was perfected by a brother by the name of Antara. So even the language of Islam, because remember, the Islam did not have an official language at its birth. In fact, the Quran wasn't even written until after the Prophet, blessings on that brother, had passed away. And his son, his second adopted son, Bailao, was sent to Ethiopia while the Prophet was getting himself together in Medina after he was ejected from Mecca. Now, Mecca itself, that Kaaba that is worshipped, that is circled, that Kaaba is a black stone which is a remnant of an astronomical observatory that the Chemites had as a sister station to the Grand Lodge of Luxor. So in this area, the reason why that black stone plays such an important role in Islam is because of its relationship with Africa. And that's why it's called a Kaaba, because a Kaaba in ancient Kemetic Kaaba is a soul of breath. It is the essence, it's the aura that surrounds you. It's called a Kaaba. It's what's inside of you gives you the breath of life. For instance, in an egg, when, when a, a chick is about to come forward, the egg don't crack. The chick takes a breath in the egg. The suction cracks the egg. Hmm. See, so the soul of breath, the Kaaba, is what activates life, which opens it up for life. And to Chemites, it was called Kaaba. Ka being the uh, spirit, and the Ba is the soul. So the Kaaba together becomes the soul of breath, which brings life. You know mothers who have had children in here. You know when you have what is known as what they call the bloody show. When you begin to flow, when you're about to give birth. What gives birth is that baby inside of you takes a human breath. Because up until that point, that baby's living in ammonionic fluid, not amniotic fluid. See, they left out an E. The amniotic fluid is really ammonionic fluid, or the living fertile waters. So inside of the web, inside of your womb, what breaks your egg that then starts the fluids from moving forward, which is called the bloody show, is the baby taking a breath. And in taking a breath, it's a different breath from breathing in the fluids. It's what cracks your womb that opens up, and that's when you start to contract. The ancient Chemites knew this in their story in the Aten text. That's what they wrote when they talked about, but they made the metaphor of the cackler and the chick that comes forward from the egg who's given the breath of life to breathe. While they told it in the form of a chick, they were talking about life in an egg. That life that separates itself from the reptilian, from the mammal. The mammal meaning the mother carries the baby inside as opposed to that essence of life laying an egg and it goes on the outside. That's the difference between a reptile and a mammal. Mammals have the egg inside and reptiles lay them on the outside. But the way in which they come to life is the same exact way. The essence of life inside takes a breath. The breath creates suction. Suction cracks the egg. Some heavy stuff for us to know, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> for, for people that are not supposed to be too heavy, we real heavy. Because that's some dynamic embryology right there. Teach. You got to know embryology to be able to say something like that. And then to put it in a metaphor means you not only know that it happens in the human form, you know it happens in the, in the lower life forms also, if you want to call them lower life forms. Christians suffered severe persecution during the 200s. Many Romans blamed them for causing the evils of time by having offended tr the traditional Roman gods. Now, there are two things that you need to know. Constantine I was named emperor, emperor of Rome's western province in 306. Because remember, the Catholic Church splits. You get an east side and you get a west side. Okay. Constantine becomes uh, the, the named emperor of Rome's western province. Now, it broke down. And in 312, Constantine defeated his major rival after having a vision promising victory if he fought under the sign of the cross. In 313, Constantine and Licinius, emperor of the eastern provinces, granted Christians freedom of worship. 
Christians, uh, Constantine and Licinius, ruled jointly until 324 when Constantine defeated the co-emperor in war. Constantine, who later became known as the so-called Great, moves his capital to Byzantium. He moves it from the western area to the eastern area and then takes over the whole concept. He now names this city that he takes over in Byzantium of this Byzantine empire, he names this capital Constantinople after himself. Now, after Constantine died in 337, his three sons and two of his nephews fought for control of the Roman Empire. Julian was one of uh, these nephews. Now, Julian tried to spread Christianity. Now, what he did, uh, Justinian, and then later on Theodosius, what they both did was that they burned all of the comedic books and closed down all of the comedic uh, temples. So you can see the way in which they were able to get Christianity in place was to destroy the comedic legacy because the comedic legacy was the papacy of their day. The world was surrounded by this concept of caress. Ka meaning spirit, rest means to rise. This idea that the human spirit could rise or resurrection. What the Western uh, people did was that they attempted to get people to believe more in the sacred aspect of Christ than in the secular. So Constantine develops an idea that he's going to have a conference at Nicaea. At this conference of Nicaea, what Constantine does, he invites all of the cardinals, bishops, and everybody all around the world. But what he's really doing, he's setting up the ones that don't agree with him to be killed. And bring the ones that do agree with him into the, and form this Holy Roman Empire. One of the bishops that don't agree with him is an African from Kemet known as Arius. When Arius gets to Constantinople, he gets almost close to the city. When, when he finds out what the real deal is, that he's about to be killed, he flees into Europe and he brings his followers with him. And his followers are from that point on known as Arians. So wouldn't Hitler have a heart attack to know that he was named his pure race after black folk? <laughs> it's very stuff, isn't it? But when you understand history, yes, sir. it becomes so clear yes. what you got to do. Beautiful. Brothers and sisters, I have um, basically developed uh, the concept of, or, or also to take this and then we'll close out here, that what really is, is, is to close out of the um, decline and fall of the Roman Empire is that they're constantly getting weaker. And what happens is that um, uh, the Western Roman Empire uh, really got weak. Eastern uh, Roman Empire is getting very weak. But then out of the German areas, uh, the Vandals, the Visigoths, and other Germanic peoples invade Spain, Gaul, and Northern Africa. In 410, the Visigoths loot Rome. The fall of the empire is often dated at 476 A.C.E. That year, the Germanic chieftain, known as Odassa, forced Romulus Augustus, uh, uh, Romulus Augustulus, the last ruler of the empire from the throne. Germanic chiefs had already begun to carve up the empire into several kingdoms. The Eastern Kingdom survived as the Byzantine Empire until 1453, when the Turks captured Constantinople. Now that's to come later on. But, that, but the key to understand is that while the Roman Empire fell, what Constantine put in place was the fact that the Holy Roman Empire did not die. The Holy Roman Empire sidestepped into the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and the emperor became pope. And that's still amongst us today. I'd like to take a break. When we come back, we'll deal with the Byzantine Empire, and we'll deal with the Crusades themselves. Give that Hotel. man a black hand. <laughs> We're going to take around a half hour break, patronize the brother as the videos. Brother, uh... Year 2000, if you did not understand what happened in uh, October 1492. No way to understand October 1492 if you don't understand January 2nd, 1492. No way to understand uh, January 2nd, 1492 without understanding the role of the Moors and then understanding the Crusades. So this evening's presentation really is dealing with the Crusades, but it really is trying to backtrack to give a common sense approach for us to understand how we got to be put into this kind of a position. The first part of our presentation, we dealt with ancient Rome. What I'd like to talk about now is I'd like to talk about uh, Byzantium, or the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is so very important because it was in 1096 
that the then um, leader of the area, um, the, the emperor of this particular area, the leader of Byzantium, or the Byzantines, called over to the western half for support and help. And it was that call to the Pope in the western half of the Roman Empire that the, that the return call of it would bring Peter the Hermit and others into the Crusades. But there's a historical way of looking at this. The Byzantine Empire was a continuation of the Roman Empire. In fact, it is known as the Eastern Roman Empire because it ruled what had been the eastern part of the Roman Empire. But remember, the, the emperor couldn't handle the whole empire. So what they had to do was break it up into two. The Byzantines preserved ancient Greek literature and philosophy as well as Roman governmental and legal traditions. Christianity, Greek culture, and Roman cultures uh, flourished in the empire, which thus linked and served as a link between ancient and modern European civilizations. This is the connecting factor. The people of the Byzantine Empire called themselves Roman. The word Byzantine comes from Byzantium, the Greek name for a city on the Bosporus, which is a river. The Bosporus, a strait, forms part of a waterway that connects the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And so many of us were talking about geography. And I want to encourage you that the next time we come together, that while I'm giving you this information in words now, we'll have many different kinds of maps, because I want you to see the maps of this. I'm grounding you in time now, which is history. Next time we come together, I'm going to ground you in geography, which is space. When we are grounded in space and, and time, there's no place that you can't go. But the next time we come together, you'll see the Black Sea, and you'll see the Mediterranean Sea, and you'll see this straight as to why this would be important. In, 30, uh, in 330 ACE, after the Christian era, the Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Byzantium, which is now today called Istanbul, Turkey. The city, the city was renamed Constantinople after him. Some historians believe the, the Byzantine Empire began that year. Others believe it began in 395 when the Roman Empire actually split into the Western Roman and the Eastern Roman Empire. The, the Byzantine Empire ended after the Turks con, uh, conquered Constantinople in 1493. Byzantium was founded by the Greeks in the mid 600s BCE, before the Christian era. It became part of the Roman Empire in the 100s BC. In AD 306, Constantine the Great became the emperor of the western half of the Roman Empire. In 395, after the death of Emperor Theodosius, remember Theodosius was another one of the ones that closed all of the Kemetic temples in Egypt. But that is because they were taking what was in the Egyptian temples and forming their own fate system out of this. So that if people went back into the Egyptian temples, the Kemetic temples, they would see where they were getting their information from. So in taking the information and then closing down the temple, you would lose sight of where it came from. Let me give you today's example, the numbers. Okay, this big lotto thing that everybody's going wild over, that came out of brothers and sisters in our community. You see, this was our business that we developed. And by the way, it came out of our dreams. That's another thing, but I gotta come back and talk to you about dreams for you to understand where that came from. We just, we, we just substituted money for good luck. <laughs> but the numbers, if you, if you knew the pattern of the numbers of the universe, because the universe is numbers, if you understood the patterns of the universe, you could call forward a pattern that would let you know things that would help you in your life. However, because we needed money, we, we, we resurrected the concept of numbers, but we substituted good fortune for money. So instead of winning good fortune, we won money. This then, in the 70s, they took it from us. And they made our numbers illegal and their numbers legal. This is what was going on in the temples. See, when I tell brothers and sisters this, particularly the ones that play numbers, they understand. <laughs> because I'm giving you a real live example of how somebody takes something that's yours, that's real, put their name on it, makes yours illegal, and legalizes theirs. Now that was illegal. It was illegal to play the numbers, but it was illegal because we were in charge. 
Same thing with horse racing. We were the original horse racers. But when so-called organized crime got involved in it, they took it over. And then horse racing became legal. Same thing with dogs. Uh, I, I know in, in Boston they race dogs, greyhound dogs, same thing there. But this idea of what they did with the temples, they took the information of the Asarian drama, of Asar and Setan, of the universe, the cosmic universe, life in the hereafter, that whole judgment scene is ours. To sit at the right hand of God came out of the judgment scene at the temple of Ma'at, where your heart would be judged for your life on earth. And if you miss, if your heart was, and they took the feather of Ma'at, I have material on Ma'at, they would take the heart, their feather of Ma'at and put it on one side of the scale. And they would take your heart and put it on the other side of the scale. And if your heart was heavier than the feather, they had a little animal that was right up underneath that scale called the devourer of evil hearts that they would throw your heart in because they believed that your heart was the symbolic representation of who you were as a person. This is why we get the heart in Valentine's Day. The whole idea of the heart, that I give you my heart. When you say you give me your heart, it means that you give the essence of your being, the essence of who you are. Everything that's about you, your judgment of who you are, your character, your morality, is all symbolized by your heart. Soul. Your soul and all of that, wrapped up in this, how you truly feel. So that's why your heart was used as a representation of who you were as a person. So you get to saying my heart is as light as a feather. Mm -hmm. Or you say, I have a heavy heart. You're guilty, you feel guilty. Well, that's where that comes from, it comes directly. But now to trace that back into your own heritage, people wouldn't even think about that because that comes in the language of English and we all know where everything comes from in English. But we would never even understand the relationship that we have had in formation of the philosophy and the psychology of life in the world today. Now, the Byzantines organized many laws of the ancient Romans. The collection of these laws became known as the Justinian Code, and ever since it has been the basis of the legal systems of many countries. Now, the whole name Justice, Ma'at. See, another thing, they just, they just ripped it off. That's ours. The Code of Laws, they never had Code of Laws. Look at how they deal with their laws now. They got some code. They don't got no code. There are two things that Professor John Henry Clark taught us that Europeans could never have created. Democracy and Christianity. They've never been democratic and they know nothing about how to treat someone like a Christian. Yet they claim to have been the originators of both. Even in their democracy, even in the democracy of Greece, 85% of Greece were slaves. When they were talking about freedom, they were talking about that upper class being equal. Look at your dollar bill. That dollar bill was formed when Africans and women were enslaved in America. When I say women, I mean women of European descent too. On your dollar bill, it says, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Now, who are they talking about out of many? Out of many European men, because when that was written, Women and Africans and people of color, Chinese women weren't even allowed in the country at this time. You couldn't bring Chinese women in this country. Only the men could come. And they had to live in hostels together. And those that didn't work on the railroad, there was only two other things they could do if they didn't work on the railroad. Anybody got an idea? They still do it. Cook and laundry, that's it. Chinese laundry and Chinese restaurant. And chop suey was created in Jamaica. <laughs> Bunch of Europeans went into a restaurant with Chinese people cooking, and they, they said they were hungry. And Chinese people said, well, we don't have, we don't have food. <laughs> you ain't gonna go out there and tell them that, they'll kill you. So they said, just chop up all that suey there. And suey was what they gave pigs. So they chopped suey. And today we go in there very proudly and ask for <laughs> chopped suey. We asked them for chopped garbage. Because <laughs> they were too afraid to tell them Europeans they didn't have no food. And they still call pigs suey, suey, suey. Yeah, exactly. That's how you call pigs. But see, this is history. And when you put things into its, its perspective, there are things that you can understand that you can't go back. This is why when Dr. Ben told us, when we were going to Kemet in 1983, I remember he told us that uh, he didn't want us to blame uh, him for what was going to happen when we came back from Kemet. 
He said, because the people that are sitting in this church are not the people that are going to come back. He said, just don't blame me. And he was right. With all that I thought I knew about my culture and my history, when you go to Egypt and you see what we did, you know that we were a mighty people, you know. Just Abu Simbel alone. Just the pyramids, you see. Again, going back to geography and the importance of looking at things. We see it in a book, we see it on TV, but that box is but yay big on the TV. Pictures and books are but yay big. But when you go into Kemen and you actually look at the pyramids, it's a whole nother situation. When you look at Abu Simbel and you look at those four statues that are outside Abu Simbel, there's a flush that comes through your body. There's an energy that goes through you that you cannot be the same African ever again. You can't. There's a brother I know that is part of the United African Movement, and, and he has often given me the, the, the courtesy that, that he comes to get me because I carry a lot of material. Like, like my brother Yusuf, you know, will come and give me a ride because I don't have a car. Well, you can see by the things that I talk about, people are not going to make me get enough money to be able to get a car. They're going to try to slow That's why I appreciate people coming to get me. Because let me tell you something. This information is liberating. It's emancipatory. It can make you leave this room and deal with your life totally different. It can, it can make you unhate the hater and deal with them in a way that puts them in their place. Because, you know, I need to come back. I need to come back and tell you the story about the Usarian drama and actually what that story is about. See, but, you know, I, you know like, I get off on so many different tangents and other stories that are linked up in what I'm talking about. But at the same time, there's a number of different things that you've got to understand fundamentally, you see, because you can never destroy evil. For as long because when you destroy evil, you destroy good. You've got to always remember this. This is what the Assyrian drama is telling us. This is why when, when Peru gets his evil uncle and ties him to a rock, it's his mother, the wife of a saw, that frees Sesson from the rock. And her son comes back and says to his mother, but, but he keeps your husband and my father. Why don't you let him go like that? Why? She, she represents determination. She's the essence of determination within us as a people. And she said the same determination good has is the same determination evil has. It's only the direction in which they're using it that makes any difference. And so, so I have to free him because he was determined to be free. But you've got to understand that you cannot tie evil down. You must freely put it into place. See, we're trying to tie down evil. We're trying to destroy evil. You'll never destroy evil. Because even if we destroy every evil person, evil shows for example, and then what you do is put evil in its place. Us as a people, our iterations that we're addicted to, the things that we do that are not right, our jealousy and our enemies, those things that keep us down, you'll never, ever, ever get rid of it. Those are part of our personality. Says Hohan in each and every one of us. You'll never get rid of it. You'll merely put it in its place. Like, you know, I'll tell you in a minute. In me is the spirit of... Colin Ferguson. <laughs> I'm telling you, Colin, and, and any black person in this room doesn't have Colin Ferguson. There's something wrong with you. Oh, right. Let's be real about this. Now, come on. We all kind of tired of the way we've been treated. Let's be serious about this. Inside me, someone just like Colin Ferguson. The only difference is Colin Ferguson let that person out of prison. <laughs> I got that person in prison. And when Colin is at his strongest in me, I only let him out of bars. Just let people know. Colin is innocent. Don't let him out. Because you know it's a sister that stands by a jail cell that's going to get him out. It's feminine principles that's going to let Colin Ferguson out of us. Because you know sisters have a way of taking care of business when it's time. You know? It's sisters that tell brothers, hey, let's get busy. That's right. So I do have a Colin Ferguson in me. The spirit of Colin Ferguson in me. And some people get a little unsettled. Well, maybe you should be unsettled. But you know, you know, because I threw a, a, a rock in a pack of dogs. And while all the dogs scattered from the rock, the only one that to yelp was the one that got hit. Mm. <laughs> so maybe you need to check yourself. I'm not speaking of you, I'm speaking of groups out here. Colin is in us, and in every one of us, is in each, every human being. Their problem is that Colin run amok among them. Quick. And they'll do it very quickly, and then they'll get mad at you if Colin shows his face. They step on your toes and get upset when you say, ouch. Not only do I say, ouch, I believe in what Malcolm said, make it so they don't step on nobody's foot again. Oh, and, and I'm only telling you what is survival. I'm not telling you to go out here and do anything that is against your will or against common sense. 
I'm just saying you need to protect yourself. And I'm, I'm totally for gun control. I believe in gun control. Control your gun. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we have to face as a people is to be brave enough to say what needs to be said. Right? At the same time, keeping it under moral control. Because when you get too much like them, you lose your morality. You become them. And that which you try to put in check is what you become as a person. So I'm trying to walk a fine line by analyzing this in a way that I present information in a way that is not attempting to say something, but at the same time, it's opening us up to know that it's out there to be understood. And that's, that's what I'm dealing with. Native American tradition has taught me. One of the proverbs of Native American people says, we learn, we learn to overpower the European when we learn how to lie. The problem with Native American peoples in this hemisphere was that we met Columbus's boat with gifts. And as we turned our back to show them the way onto the land, they put us in handcuffs. What Native American people are saying is that when they come to your shores, don't turn your back on them. To understand who you're dealing with. Now they say, is all of them? I'm not saying all of them are like that. But enough of them are like that for you to keep yourself in check. Trust the snake. And, and I always tell a story about the snake. You got to understand the story of the snake. And you can't be surprised if the snake bites you. Because you knew it was a snake when you picked it up. Okay. Um, the, the decline and the invasion. After Justinian's death, barbarians attacked the empire on all fronts. Germans in particular. The Lombards attacked, uh, seized parts of Italy, and the Slavs and the Avars invaded the Balkan Peninsula. Persian invasions weakened the empire during the late 500s and early 600s. But a new enemy attacked the weakened empire in 634. See, here's where the Moors come in. A new enemy. See, it wasn't a new enemy. It was somebody that was like Colin Ferguson that was reacting to what the Byzantium Empire had done to them. And these were the Africans. By 642, Moors had conquered Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Moors. There's no such thing as Arabs. Arabs don't exist in the sense of the word that's being used. To, I use the word Afrab. Because to be an Arab, you have to be African. That's what makes you an Arab. Just like a Semite. To be a Semite, you must be part African. That's what semi, mixture, you've got to be African. What makes Saddam Hussein look the way he looks is that his people came down out the mountains as peoples of the northern hemisphere and they commingled with the Africans of the southern lands. These people who commingled with Africans took their civilization, Mesopotamia, uh, all along the Euphrates and Tigris River, meeting these people coming up approximately somewhere out of 2000 BC, coming down into this part of the world between the Tigris and Euphrates River, commingling with these people marrying with these people, became what we know today as Saddam Hussein, became Yasser Arafat's, became Muammar Gaddafi's. That is, who, that is who they are. They are the children of this mixture of Africans and the, and the Eurasians coming up out of the 51st parallel. Okay? The, the evidence of this is all over because there's nothing that they have where they came from that in any way looks like what they came down and did. So it had to have been there before they came. So that these are who these individuals are. So the Moors come down, they, they begin to develop different kinds of ideas. Um, the church splits, it gets weaker. And during the 800s, the empire began to expand again. However, Byzantine armies drove the Moors back on several fronts. Now, from 867, you're dealing with the Moors are already in this part of the world now. They're controlling it. They're bringing civilizations. They're going into other parts of the world. They're buying texts from the Akkadians and from all of the ancient civilizations. They're already the caretakers of the Moorish. Uh, they're already the caretakers of the Kemetic legacy. 
They go and they, they learn Greek, which is Ethiopian language, by the way. Every character of the Greek alphabet is and comes from an Ethiopic letter, from alpha to omega. That's why they only had alpha and omega in the beginning. That's why their alphabet grew, because they were learning the alpha beta as they went along. If you look at alpha and omega, if you put alpha above omega, that's the sign of the ankh. Alpha and omega, from the beginning to the end. Life itself was the ankh. That's where they got it from. All they did was split the ankh into two symbols. One became the beginning of their alphabet, one became the end of the alphabet. But that comes directly out of the Ethiopic script that the Egyptians or the Chemites got. Because there's nothing that the Chemites got that they didn't first get the idea from the inner African brothers from Sudan, Somalia, and what today we call Ethiopia. Because Ethiopia as a country today was really part of a much larger African nation. There was a relationship between uh, the 18th dynasty, the Hatshepsut dynasty, and Puanit, which was Somalia. They were cousins. They were co-rulers. That's why you have that, that uh, meeting between um, the 18th dynasty, Hatshepsut's dynasty, and the Somalians. That's where that big story is coming from. And the only reason why it comes down to us is because it's written. But there are probably other expeditions that occurred that are just as dynamic. There's a relationship between the comedic legacy of the Northern Africa and the Monomotapan Empire. All that area there is related. What the European did in 1885 was carve up Africa into countries. And by political or economic reasons, carved up Africa. So today when we look at it, we look at Kenya and Ethiopia, not realizing that the Konso people are both Southern Ethiopians and Northern Kenyans. They're the same people. But because we today call these two different countries, we think they're two different people. They're not. They're the same people. It's just that they divided the country up. So there's a relationship between the Nubians of Sudan and the Chemites of Egypt, or Kemet. There's a relationship between the Somalians, or the Puani, with the Ethiopians, with the Saudi Arabian Africans. But again, because of the input and the movement of peoples in the 500s and 600s coming out of Mesopotamia, mixing with these Africans in, in this peninsula of Saudi Arabia, we think that those are the original people of the land, and they're not. It's like 2,000 years from now, showing someone a picture of Bill Clinton and George Bush and saying that these are Native American peoples. That's what we're doing with the people that we're looking at in Kemet and in Saudi Arabia today, even China. I mean, the first dynasties of China were Africans. First, all the Dravidians, the Japanese, were, were peoples made up of individuals that came, the Moors or Ethiopians traveling across Southern Asia, settling in South Korea, then moving South Koreans onto the island of Japan. That's who the Japanese are. They are a mixture of Moors or Ethiopians, the South Koreans, and the Ainu people, which were the short statured and booty people. That's why they're short statured. Dark. And dark, very dark. I'm out of this, I'm all for it. I personally don't know how they could ever repair what they've done. And it's not for me to make that because they didn't do it against me. Who am I to say what's going to make everything right when the person that did it all wrong is not me? It's easy for me to forgive and forget. It, it also might be the right thing. It's not my place to forgive or forget. It's not my place at all to deal with the issue. Because what they did to the Australians, huh. oh my goodness, that, that story alone. What they did to the Australians, what they did to the Khoisan, Look at Nelson Mandela. You know, there's a difference looking at Nelson Mandela and Robert Mugabe. Yes. They're both African people. But Nelson Mandela belongs to a group of people known as the Khoi Khoi and San. San, that we today call, derogatorily is called today, the Hottentot and the Bushmen. But they are the original people yes. that the Dutch met at Table Bay in 1590, 1562 or 1592. They didn't meet the darker complexion Robert Mugabe. They met the Khoisan that were along the Kalahari Desert. What the Dutch, and, I, and you know, people get very offended when you talk about people's religion, but you gotta understand who, who was in charge of the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company. But you've got to understand where certain religious groups went after they were expelled from Europe or Spain. 
the first place they went was Holland to build up their business. And in Holland, they developed the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company. The Dutch West India came to the Americas, and the Dutch East India Companies remained in the Eastern lands. And what they did to those people, our people in Australia and Tasmania, they almost just, you know, when you look at what they did to the people in Tasmania, you really do have to question who the Tasmanian devil really is. <laughs> And this is our history. There's a brother, Renoko Rashidi, yes. who can drop that information on you. You need to check into his work, and I'm sure that I'm sure that there's material out, not only here, but in places there's books and things like that that he has written on the Africans in the East. There's another brother um, uh, that works with Dr. Ben. He's a, a eye doctor, uh, Dr. Dr. Arthur Lewis. Lewis. Dr. Arthur Lewis, who has done a lot of work in the Pacific Islands, in Melanesia, Polynesia, and Hawaii. I saw a, a, a picture about the, the last, Ethi um, last Hawaiian princess, and all of us got an aunt look like her. All of us have an aunt that look like that woman. Hawaiian. The Hawaiian queen. Beautiful sister. But we all have an aunt. Queen Kamehameha. Well, that's king. King, king Kamehameha was, a, was the last king. This brother had very curly hair, very, very dark complexion. Hawaii was an African island. The Grand Clegg has done work on that. So, so the Samoans, all of this area is an African area, but when you have other people coming down into this area and then superimposing their gene pool in larger numbers, then the people's look changes. But when the look changes, that's when you start talking about those are the original people, and they're not. The, the original Native American people were my complexion. They didn't look like what they, was on TV there. They didn't look like that. The original Native American peoples were a very dark complexion people. Copper color people. All throughout that area. And of course, through migration and through weather, through different things, we, we altered our complexion. But that's why when they came, the first thing they called us, red men. And we call them what? Pale face. <laughs> so there had to have been such a stark difference in complexion that we would make it a point to make that difference. But this is who we are, good or bad, right or wrong, superior, inferior, that's to be decided at a later date. What it is, is that we should know this. Yes. So the Byzantine Empire, in the invasion and the conquest, you have Germanic tribes again coming through, they're destroying the, the Byzantines. Now with that, I'm now ready to talk about this evening's presentation. <laughs> I'm only playing. No, I'm not really though. Okay, the Crusades were military, now we're gonna deal with the Crusades because you gotta understand what the Crusades were. The Crusades were military expeditions organized, so-called, as they said, to recapture Palestine during the Middle Ages. Now you can understand what's going on in that area because today it's called Israel. Yesterday it was called Palestine. But keep in mind that before yesterday it was called Canaan. So be careful whose side you go on because the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians what the Palestinians did to the African Canaanites. You shall reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. Yasser Arafat's ancestors destroyed the African nations of this particular area and said that God told them to do it. So does that ring a bell? Well, actually, the Israelites, when you, when you look at the concept of, of Israel, as it is today. These are all stories that are being told about Israel. Uh, yes, the, the biblical Israelites. If you just move away from the concept of Israelite and you look at the people historically, not the revelation, not the revelation. I'm not dealing with the spirituality of this. The historical aspect of this, the physical people that lived in this area were African people. They were known as Canaanites. That's how you know Christ had to have been black. Because cousin was the wedding at Canaan. You remember when he changed that water into wine? Well, that was at Canaan. So if that's his cousin's wedding, and his cousin's is a Canaanite, plus Christ had to have been black. Even if you want to deal with the story, the, the metaphor, Christ had to have been black. Because if everyone was looking for him, and he was blonde and blue eyed, and he was in this area, all he had to do was say, find a white boy. <laughs> You know, this is common sense. Just find a European blonde hair and blue eyes. Because everybody in that area was black. 
It's like trying to find a European in Harlem. Just say, go find European. With the blonde hair, because everybody in the community is black. Everybody in this area was black. The fact that he had such a difficult time finding the Christ child had to have been, he had to have looked like the major population of the people. There's so many different stories that will tell you and will lead you to the realities of the truth. But see, sometimes the illusion will stop you, like Moses. Going, going back to what you're saying about the early Israelites and the Jews. Now, one of the miracles that Moses performed was that he put his hand in his garment and he took it out and it was white. Now, if he was already white, that wouldn't have been a miracle. But if I put my hand in here and I pull it out white, that's a miracle. So he had to have been of a dark complexion the miracle to be in fact. Now Moses, Moses means son of in the comedic language. That's why you have Ram Moses, which is Ramses. Thut Moses, which is Thoth Moses, son of Thoth. Ram Moses is son of the sun. Moses comes from the comedic derivation of the word mez. Again, we've got to be careful because we don't know that Neter was a spoken language. But the idea of Moses, as, as we were talking earlier, seemed to have come from a fact that the people who were trying to overthrow this Kemetic government, you remember Akhenaten changed his name from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten. When he did that, he revitalized an African faith system known as Atenism. He didn't create Atenism. Atenism had been in inner Africa for hundreds if not thousands of years. King. Both his father and his mother, who? Akhenaten was the new king. No. Oh. Oh, yeah, okay, Middle Kingdom. You, you, you can see it. It's, it's the flip side of ominism, except you, you have a different in terms of the philosophical underpinning of the faith system, okay? Atonism is the belief that there is but one creative force. Ominism says there's one creative force, but this one creative force emanates in everything that's on the planet. Therefore, you have dogs with the gift of, uh, of smelling. You have birds with the gift of sight. So God, while being one in form, has many different representations. And that these representations became natures to which the Amun priesthood would create different kinds of temples. Atonism said there was one faith system and there was no other intermediaries, and that is the human to the God force. Let's not have no saints. It's just we and God, who was Aten. The Amun priesthood seemed to have been taking advantage of the people and their mind, by giving large sums of money to the Amen priesthood during the Ramses time. Um, no, I'm sorry, during Akhenaten's time. And what Akhenaten was attempting to do was trying to bring Kemet back so that everybody was part of this faith system. So what he did is that he began to look at Atonism as a form of taking over the faith of the people. But to do that, he had to depopularize or depower the Amen priesthood who was like the generals, okay? Because remember, Kemet is run by theocracy. It's not just a political party or a secular party, it is a faith system. So the Amen priesthood doesn't like this, so the Amen priesthood, in revolt, it is believed that Amen, when Amen Hotep changes his name from Amen Hotep to Aken Aten, and then said that Aten was the great god, he got the Amen priesthood upset. He was taking power away from them. And so it is believed that the intrigue of the court had it so that somehow one morning Akhenaten didn't wake up. That is what is believed. He was murdered. He had a brother by the name of Tutankhaten, a younger brother named Tutankhaten. Both of them were children of Tai and Amenhotep IV. And Akhenaten, that was his name. And so the priesthood whispered in the Tai's ear, better put your son in check. You remember what happened to your last son? It's going to happen to him too. So Tutankhamen Ten changed his name to Tutankhamen. He was killed too. I came on board who was a, a, a courtier of Akhenaten or a general of Akhenaten, uh, 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 not, not a general, but a um, vizier. advisor, vizier to Akhenaten. I came and then Horam Hab who was a general. All of them were gotten rid of within a matter of a couple of years, and then came the 19th dynasty. It is believed that by the time Ramses II came to power, who was, Ramses was a child of, of or grandchild of Setai, that there was a problem. They didn't appreciate the Amen priesthood, and there were some people who were attempting to bring the Aten priesthood back into play. 
bringing back this Ad, Ad, Aten priesthood back into play, got the Amen priesthood upset. And these believers and these followers, these Moses, sons of Akhenaten, were expelled from Kemet. But before they were expelled, they were all rounded up, which became the Exodus. And these Africans, and some Semites, because they were trying to get rid of the last of the Hicksocks also, they rounded them all up and kicked them out. And that's why you could see them roaming all around, because they didn't have no place to go. They were kicked out of Kemet. These Semites, intermingling with these African Atenists, came together and settled in various parts of the world. And it is these people being impacted by these Africans that today, we today call Jews. Hmm. Now I'm speaking historically now. Because remember, Moses was murdered by his followers. That's where the whole idea of the Messiah came from. Remember one time Moses came, read the original books. Not the ones that have been going over three and four times. Read the original books and Moses came out the mountains one time with a message. And the people were so angry at him for having them drag around the desert. They were hungry. They, was, they, 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 they were feeling bad. They murdered him. But in their shame and in their fear of killing the father, they promised that a son would come, a Messiah. Messiah coming from Moses, a son of the son would come to redeem the world and to open up the gates of heaven for the sin that they had committed in killing their father. And so this is where the whole story of them waiting for the Christ to come. All of a sudden, the story of Heru, or the resurrected one comes around, they adapt this story. And so the Old Testament breaks off like, a, like the old dynasty, and a new dynasty is formed. So you have the Old Testament giving birth to the New Testament. And the New Testament started with the concept of the Annunciation, the Conception, and the birth of Christ, moving into the life of Christ. And Christ, Christ means to rise by the resurrected one. Now, when you go back 2,000 years, what happened astronomically 2,000 years ago is that we left the, the Aries and moved into the Piscean Age. Aries being the ram, okay, ram, moving from the ram to the fish. So from the Amen priesthood, we have expressly coming through, becoming the fisher of men, the Piscean Age. The ram, the child of the ram is called a what? A lamb. So you have a lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, symbolic, but everything comes from us. That's our story that we told in a metaphor. Give understanding the pattern of the universe. Every faith system is built on astronomy. Those three wise men are the stars in the belt of Orion. It has nothing to do with three wise men. And the, three, the reason why you have the epiphany, six day, the sixth day of January, is because that's when the Sirius star rises back up out of the east. Sirius comes back out to play, and the three stars of Orion point to Sirius. And in the southern sky, Sirius rises and is pointing six days after and it has been out of the sky for 72 days. So that is why embalming took 72 days. And that's why uh, Anubis was the patron of embalming because Sirius is in the dog star. That's some heavy stuff for us. Isn't it? Islam is built on astronomy. Christianity is built on astronomy. The reason why Christ is in the manger is because the stars are formulated in such a way that it, the sky is called the manger at this time of the year. And the formulation of this child star being reborn again, Sirius, is the concept of the child being born in the manger. 